What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. To be completely honest, this kind of scenario is something that I never really wanted to do. At least at first. It's kind of a weird concept and I've seen others like it before and they're not really my cup of tea. But I have gotten a lot of suggestions for this one. And you all know, I'm a man of the people. And given how much this was suggested, not only on my channel but outside of it, I decided I may as well take it into my hands. And even though I do see the concept as kind of fanfiction-y, I feel like I can get around that in a really simple way. One that surprisingly would make a lot of sense. At least, as much sense as Chi-Chi becoming a Saiyan could make. Since I'm not too sure about continuing this, let's set a like goal of 3500 likes. If we hit that like goal, I'll continue with another part of the series. Anyways, let's begin this story. So this whole scenario circles around the idea that Chi-Chi becomes a Saiyan. And that's a very important distinction. It's not that she starts out as one, but she becomes one. Through a wish specifically. This is actually a pretty popular trope that I've seen. Scenarios where Shenron is used to power someone up by chaining them into a Saiyan or something else. And that's what we'll do here. So how does this wish actually start? Well, let's actually discuss the time period first. Let's say this is during the time skip between the 23rd World Tournament and the Saiyan Saga. By this point, Goku and Chi-Chi are married, and they've already had Gohan. So all of you Gohan fans that are concerned about him becoming a pure Saiyan, not staying a hybrid Saiyan, he's gonna stay a hybrid Saiyan. But of course, over this time skip, Chi-Chi would begin to know Goku a lot better. And while we didn't really see this in the manga, a lot of filler in the anime actually showed that Chi-Chi really wanted to be the perfect wife to Goku. And we'll be using that in this scenario. She feels that maybe she can get to understand Goku more if she were more like him. But they're not really too sure how to do that. Goku then jokes about how they can ask Shenron. Maybe he can tell her everything she needs to know about him. It's a pretty clear joke, but she thinks it's actually a pretty good idea. They basically missed everything about each other's lives. Since they only reconvened back at the 20th World Tournament and missed everything before that, Shenron could actually help them catch up. Even if it's not the most romantic and genuine way. Goku says he was just joking, but hey, if that's what she wants to do, he's happy with it too. They gather their Dragon Balls and summon Shenron. And this is where things get messy. The two of them are thinking about how to phrase the wish. But the two of them aren't really that careful with their words, as they're deliberating what to say. Chi Chi says that she wishes she were more like Goku, it would be a lot easier that way to understand him. Shenron hears this and wants to clarify. So, you want to be a Saiyan? Goku doesn't understand Shenron's question. Um, she's saying she wants to be more like me. Yes, so a Saiyan. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. I hope you like that really bad pun because that's the basis of this entire scenario. Shenron understands the wish that Chi Chi wants to be like Goku, a Saiyan. They weren't careful with their words and he grants the wish. And Chi Chi wonders what just happened. They're both confused as Shenron disappears. And Goku says he must have granted the wish. She doesn't feel too different, but they trust Shenron's judgment. Whatever he did must have helped her understand Goku better. But then she feels something weird. And then Goku shouts as he sees. She now has a tail. They now realize what Shenron did. Goku obviously doesn't know what a Saiyan is yet. But whatever Shenron did, it turned her into the same monkey person that Goku is. It's just like how he had a tail as a kid, and how Gohan has one. But by now it's too late. Shenron is already gone, and even if they wanted to, they couldn't really reverse the wish. It looks like they're going to have to wait another year to do that. Now the two of them are just confused. It looks like they will have to do it the old-fashioned way after all. But now Chi-Chi has to deal with having a tail. He asks though, does she feel any different in any way? Not really, but she does know one thing. It's been a while since they've sparred. It would be pretty fun if they fought. You know, for old time's sake. Well, of course Goku's not going to turn down the fight. So, the two of them decide to spar, with Gohan and Ox King watching. It seems more changed than just her tail. Over this time skip, more continues to change. Chi-Chi's whole demeanor is different. She has more of a fighting spirit than she did before, thanks to now actually being a Saiyan unknowingly. And while she does want Gohan to grow up as a scholar, she also thinks it might be a good idea for him to fight. It could teach him a lot of discipline and he can get stronger, just like them. It wouldn't be too hard for him to get a schedule, balancing work and life. So she's not actually opposed to him fighting, which is great because Goku thought the exact same thing. And because of this, Gohan's gonna grow up a lot less passive than before. He still is more gentle natured at heart, but he gets some experience fighting earlier on, with him learning the basics of martial arts from his parents. The time skip eventually ends though, and we get to the reunion at Kame House. Goku suggests that Chi Chi should come along. Roshi would love to see their growth. It would be nice to show his old master how much they've trained together. They would bring Ox King along too, but the Nimbus Cloud only fits so many people. Especially with his size, that's not really gonna work. But he's fine staying back. He tells them to say hi to Roshi for him, as the family of three heads off. Not only is the group confused to see that Goku now has a kid, but they're more confused to see that Chi Chi now has a tail. Okay, how did that happen? Well, the two of them sheepishly explain what happened. They're not really too sure either, it was a mishap with Shenron. But it did help them understand each other better. The relationship is already fine regardless. 
But here, they just attribute that to Shenron. GT now really understands Goku's fighting spirit, and isn't too sure why, but they're gonna come to learn that soon. Raditz eventually does arrive on Earth, encountering Piccolo and eventually going over to Kame House. He's glad to finally see his younger brother, but something catches his eye. He's not the only Saiyan there, it appears. Goku's confused. This gives him deja vu to before when Shenron kept saying that, but Raditz explains further, and Goku realizes his mistake. That's what Shenron was asking. Accidentally, they turn Chi Chi into a Saiyan, but it's probably not the best idea to explain that to Raditz now. He's just wondering how another Saiyan got here. Sure, he knows how the kid got there. He doesn't need any of the details of that. But as for the woman, he wasn't aware of any female Saiyan being sent here. Maybe it's just a coincidence and the two of them were sent here at the same time. But whatever, this is actually better. Raditz doesn't know that Shenron granted a wish, but he tells Vegeta and Nappa on a scouter, there is another Saiyan here, plus a child that they assume is a pure Saiyan, a total of three on this planet that could help them. But of course, Goku's not going to join him, nor is Chi-Chi or Gohan. This eventually leads to Raditz kidnapping Gohan, causing them to chase him down. Let's actually discuss power levels here now, because yes, there is a bit of a change here, significant enough to change this arc. Goku's actually much stronger than normal. He hasn't been slacking off. Sure, he may have not been training as much as before, but he's training way more than he did in canon, thanks to Chi-Chi being there. His power right now is 540, with Chi-Chi actually pretty close behind at 520. Piccolo and Krillin would remain the same, with them around 400 and 200 respectively, but as for Gohan, he's much stronger too. The main difference is he actually knows how to fight here, having at least some basic knowledge. Of course, he has a kid, so his power level isn't too high, but it's at 50, which is way more than even an average person would be at. It seems low in comparison to the others, but it's actually pretty massive. And since this is still basically the same Gohan, you bet he's gonna have a rage boost, and they're not gonna be pretty considering how strong he is now. As Raditz flies off with Gohan, Gohan struggles to escape, trying to fight, but he isn't really strong enough. As he squirms in his uncle's arms, he eventually gets angry enough to release himself, surprising Raditz. Raditz checks his scouter, and Gohan's power really shot up. 2,000? There's no way. Gohan starts pummeling Raditz, hitting him with multiple attacks. It actually injures Raditz a good bit, with Raditz flung down into the ground. But Raditz has a quick counterattack, knocking Gohan out of the sky, catching him as he falls unconscious. He's not too sure what that was, but it was pretty scary. But this also really helps slow Raditz down, and he eventually sees Goku, Chi Chi, and Krillin catch up to him. Yes, Krillin came along this time, and surprisingly, Piccolo's there too, because he made an alliance with everyone. Krillin thinks that since there's three other people going along, he may as well help too. The bigger the group, the better. They wonder why Raditz looks injured, but Chi-Chi also sees that Gohan's injured, and she's not happy at all. She's the first one to jump into the fight, immediately attacking Raditz as he has a tough time dodging. He's already a bit beaten up after fighting Gohan, but now there's this. Goku jumps in too, followed by Piccolo and Krillin. They're actually making a lot of progress here. Combined, and with Raditz being weakened, they give him a pretty tough time. Almost too tough of a time. It makes him desperate. In his hands, he quickly creates a fake moon, throwing it into the sky. He knows that the other two with tails might transform, but it'll at least help him against the other three. Kakarot doesn't have a tail, and the other two people are a human and a Namekian. This might give him an advantage. He looks up at the moon, turning into a great ape. All this chaos even causes Gohan to wake up, and the first thing he sees is a fake moon in the sky. Chi Chi even turns around to see what Raditz did, accidentally causing her to transform too. Goku, Piccolo, and Krillin immediately realize that this is pretty bad. Raditz just transformed, and so did Goku's wife and son. I mean, he's seen his wife angry before, but not like this. This is terrifying. And even with them transforming, Raditz is still much stronger, and the three of them need to come up with a plan. Thankfully, Chi-Chi and Gohan try and hold Raditz off. Obviously, they're not in the right state of mind right now, but Raditz is the biggest target, and it catches their attention even though they're enraged. So thankfully, they're attacking the right person. Krillin says that they should cut off everyone's tails. That's how they got Goku to de-transform as a kid, so maybe that'll work here. It's a bit fuzzy for Goku, but it makes sense after what Roshi just told him at Kame House about him turning into a great ape as a kid. That explains those times that he woke up without a tail, and why Kami removed his. First, they aim for Raditz. Krillin's been working on a good technique to cut stuff, but it's not really perfected yet. It's his Kienzon, but without much practice, it's not too easy to aim, and it's not something that he can curve around at will. But still, it may have enough power to slice Raditz's tail off. He just needs a good shot, and attacking with Goku and Piccolo will really help. It takes some time since it's still new, but he charges a Kienzan, throwing it at Raditz. Just as he feared, Raditz was quick enough to dodge it, jumping up into the air. But as the Kienzan flies away, it's suddenly hit by another beam, one of Goku's bending Kamehameha's. He uses it to direct the Kienzan back towards Raditz. 
and by the time Raditz sees it, it's too late. Goku curves the Kamehameha up towards Raditz, propelling the Kienzan right into his tail. It's a clean hit, Raditz's tail is sliced off. But there's still the issue of Chi-Chi and Gohan, who immediately go to crush Raditz, as he's stepped on by a great ape Gohan. That's kinda gruesome, but at least they won't have to worry about him anymore. Still, these two are an issue, but they're easier to take out. They're not as strong as Raditz and can't really control themselves, so hitting them with a Kienzan won't be hard. Unlike Raditz who has control of his great ape, they can't outmaneuver this. Together, they work to slice the tails off. Piccolo's able to personally go over and grab one of them, holding it out so Krillin can cut off. So that solves that issue, but it appears Raditz is actually still alive. He's pretty badly beaten, crushed into the ground, but still alive. And of course, with him being crushed, his scouter was crushed too. He can't move, but he says one thing. The Saiyans will arrive soon, avenging his death. He laughs as he fades out of consciousness, dying on the ground. Okay, well, that was a pretty weird reunion between everyone. Eventually, Chi-Chi and Gohan wake up, and Goku explains everything that happened. She's pretty mad that her tail is gone, and that her clothes were destroyed, but after hearing more, she realizes what happened. Well, it seems like the tail was a burden, so at least it's not an issue anymore. Maybe. There's still a chance that it can grow back like it did for Goku. Chi-Chi and Gohan were also pretty injured from this fight, but that's actually a good thing. After they eventually heal, they do get power boosts. Krillin pulls Goku and Chi-Chi aside and talks to them. It was a pretty dangerous wish. Who knows what being a Saiyan will do to her? They have to be really careful with what they wish for. And the two of them realize that now. They didn't know either, and they can always reverse it later on. But maybe it's good to keep it for now. If she's a Saiyan, that means she's a lot stronger, and it could help them when the Saiyans arrive. So, it's best to actually keep her the way as she is right now. Plus, she doesn't really mind. It might actually be cool being a Saiyan. As long as they work around that entire transforming into a great ape thing. But now, everyone needs to train for the Saiyans. Piccolo's still enemies with everyone, but he decides it might be better to join them. It is an enemy of my enemy situation, so it's best to have allies. Some of the humans go train with Kami, while Goku, Gohan, and Chi-Chi train together. With Piccolo there to help. Those three are the strongest right now, so it's best that Gohan sticks with them. He seems to have a lot of potential. They all sent something weird when they were trying to chase Raditz. His power soared for some reason, and they don't know why. Gohan doesn't really know why either. It's a bit fuzzy, but he does remember attacking Raditz. Somehow he overpowered him, and the only thing he remembers is Raditz shouting the number 2000. Does that have to do with that power level thing from before? But that wouldn't make sense. When Raditz was reading everyone's power level, there's no way that Gohan could be that strong, right? Regardless, it's a good idea to train him, even if he doesn't have some weird hidden power that they don't know about. He definitely does have some potential as a fighter. Even though he's young, he could help. Roshi even steps in to help too. It has been a while since he's fought, but he's never stopped training. He can help teach Gohan some more, as well as helping against the Saiyans. Meanwhile, out in space, Vegeta and Nappa are on their way over. They're still a while out, but they're wondering what happened. First of all, Raditz getting beat is a pretty big deal. He was weak, but he shouldn't have been weak enough to be defeated by Earthlings. But even weirder is what he mentioned about another Saiyan. Not only was there a Saiyan child there, but there was a Saiyan woman. There goes all their hopes of having a hybrid Saiyan on Earth. If there were one, he probably would have been really strong, but it seems like that child is just a regular pure Saiyan. Of course, Kakarot had to marry the one other Saiyan on Earth. But is that actually the case? Vegeta begins thinking. He doesn't remember any other Saiyans being sent to Earth. He only knows that Kakarot was sent there to be safe, due to what Raditz told him. Sure, there could have been another Saiyan that had their child escape to Earth somehow, but that doesn't really seem too likely, because she seemed pretty normal. Well, normal for Earthling standards. Rather than being a murderous Saiyan, she was pretty gentle, until Gohan was attacked. But still, if she were a regular Saiyan, wouldn't she go around genociding everyone? Of course, they know Kakarot hit his head and that's what made him turn good, but did the same happen to Chi-Chi? That seems really weird. Like, what are the odds of another Saiyan being sent away to the same exact planet to be safe and hitting their head as a kid, turning good? Something doesn't really add up here. It is just a theory, but Raditz did know that there was a Namekian there. They know the Namekians have some weird magical properties, so maybe he has something to do with it. Could it be something to do with the weird wish orbs that they have? Nah, no way. That sounds even weirder. No way that they have those on Earth. But still, something about this whole situation doesn't really sit right with Vegeta. It doesn't matter though. They're all gonna die soon enough anyways, so they won't need to think about it. Maybe while they're there though, they can just ask them face to face. As everyone continues preparing on Earth, Vegeta and Nappa get closer and closer. Everyone sees some good progress. The humans would probably be around the same strength that they were in canon, but as for the Saiyans, this is gonna be very different. Same goes for Piccolo too. As mentioned last time, Goku and Chi-Chi are training with Gohan as well as Piccolo. 
hoping to boost their own strength as well as boosting Gohan's strength. Even though he's young, he still has a lot of potential and they want to try and bring that out of him. With some effective training, they could probably get him to harness that power, being able to use it in battle. It'll be a really great asset against the Saiyans once they eventually arrive. One thing that they didn't expect though was that Chi-Chi's tail grew back, as well as Gohan's. That's definitely something we're going to have to watch out for. The same happened with Goku before as a kid, and it completely crossed their mind that something like this could happen. So let's actually discuss everyone's powers. As I said, all the Earthlings are the same, so I'm not going to be covering them. But now we have some different power levels for everyone else. Goku is at a level of 7,000. He's going to be much weaker than normal since he didn't have his King Kai training. And obviously he doesn't have Kaioken either. But with great training partners, he still does get pretty strong. Equal to him is Chi-Chi, also at 7,000. She got a nice boost in power from Raditz, which helped her catch up to Goku. I mentioned this injury in the last part, and once she healed from it, it did help her catch up. Being a Saiyan really did benefit her. As for Piccolo, he's behind Chi-Chi at 5,000, a little bit stronger than he was in canon. And Gohan sees a pretty sizable increase. He also did get a power boost just like Chi-Chi from being injured last time. And he's slowly getting better and better at fighting. Right now, he's at about 3,000 for his power level. So while Goku is considerably weaker and doesn't have Kaioken, Piccolo and Gohan are much stronger, and Chi-Chi's in the fight too, and she's equal to Goku. Things are actually looking up for them, and hopefully it stays that way, but they're not too sure. Not long after, Vegeta and Nappa eventually do arrive on Earth, and they sense how massive their powers are. Even with their great strength, the Saiyans definitely will be formidable foes. So hopefully all the training that was done in preparation was enough. They wait in a wasteland, ready for the Saiyans to arrive. Vegeta and Nappa easily track everyone with their scouters, heading over quickly. They're kind of amused to see a crew like this facing them. They're outnumbered, but there's no way they're outmatched. As an appetizer, Nappa throws on the Cybermen. The Cybermen aren't too hard to dispatch. They're taken out by the humans, and Yamcha actually survives this time. Not unexpected, the Cybermen were weak and they were really just a test. Now, Nappa can actually go in and fight whoever he wants. He wonders who wants to face him first, asking if there's any takers. Someone does step up. It's Chi-Chi. She hasn't really had a real fight like this. Of course, she's had fights in the past with Goku and Raditz, but in both of them, she was heavily outmatched by herself. Here, she could finally have one where she enjoys herself. Nap is surprised. Oh, so this must be the female Saiyan that was here. It's a shame that he has to kill another one of his own, but whatever. Her, Kakarot, and that kid are definitely too soft to be Saiyans. He doesn't mind executing them. The two begin powering up, ready to fight. Chi-Chi paces herself, using all her martial arts knowledge. She's definitely stronger than Nappa by this point, but pacing herself may be a good idea, because the other Saiyan behind Nappa seems to be stronger. At first, she does struggle since she's not powered up fully, but she catches Nappa off guard as she shows off more power, utilizing her martial arts abilities. Not only does she overpower him in terms of brute strength, but her fighting abilities are much better. With a few swift movements, she's able to knock him to the side. Finishing the fight surprisingly quickly. Shocked and angered, Nappa gets up, going back towards her again. With one more punch, she knocks him away throwing him into one of the cliffs nearby as he crashes into the rocks. Nappa's still not done. He stands up once more, and his eyes scan the area. He's infuriated now. He tries to launch an attack at the humans, seeing them as weak targets that he could potentially take out with him. In one hand, he charges energy, flinging it at the humans nearby. They assume a battle stance ready to deflect it, but before they can, Piccolo jumps in front of them, and with a single quick blast, he not only destroys Nappa's attack, but destroys Nappa himself. Chi-Chi wasn't aiming to kill him, but Piccolo realized that he needed to go, finishing off the Saiyan brute. Vegeta can't hide it anymore. He is somewhat impressed. He tells him to not mistake it for concern. He's just impressed. That's really all I can say. He expected the Earthlings to be much weaker, but it seems like there were enough to take on Nappa. However, Nappa's power doesn't compare to his, not in the slightest. Even with those other Saiyans there, there's no way they'll win against Vegeta. His power and battle experience is simply too much to overcome, and he's confident. Showing no concern for Nappa's death at all, Vegeta steps up, ready to fight himself now. The group knows that they may be actually overpowered here. With Nappa, it was different because they had a few people stronger than him, but they could sense Vegeta's energy and it's definitely way off the charts. However, they know it's not over yet. Combined, they may be able to overpower him. So instead of a one-on-one -on -one fight like they did with Nappa, they're all going to fight Vegeta together. Vegeta doesn't care. He still feels that he's at an advantage and knows he could win this, or at least thinks he can. He clearly doesn't realize the extent of everyone's power, especially combined. Immediately, the three strongest fighters jump in first, Goku, Chi-Chi, and Piccolo. Combined, their powers are almost enough to match Vegeta's. But still, that's only their combined power, and powers aren't everything. Vegeta knows how to fight three-on-ones, even with strong opponents like this. He compliments their strength, but tells them it won't be enough. The other fighters wait, standing ready, hoping to jump in and help. 
They can also provide some support from the sidelines, but with three people fighting Vegeta right now, they can't really get in their way. As the fight progresses more and more, he comes to learn that the humans and the child there are strong, which kind of surprises him. The Saiyans seem pretty strong too, same for that Namekian. He may be in over his head, this may be more of a challenge than he expected, but still, he's not deterred. He powers up further, showing off his full strength, shouting as he lifts his arms out, creating a massive explosion around him, knocking everyone away. The fighters around him tank the blast and get back up, seeing Vegeta charging something in his hands. Goku, Piccolo, and Chi-Chi recognize that from before. Wait, that's the same fake moon thing that Raditz created. They notice Vegeta's power drops significantly as he creates this, but he doesn't care. He'll transform into a great ape and defeat them that way. As he cocks his hand backwards to throw it up, he suddenly senses energy coming towards him. Krillin flung Kianzan at him, trying to cut Vegeta's hand off. But Vegeta's quick enough to dodge it, jumping out of the way. He smirks knowing that he saw right through that trick. But they expected that. Really, it was a distraction. As Vegeta's hand is out with the energy still in it, it's then hit by a powerful blast from Piccolo. Not only destroying the artificial moon in the hand, but also breaking Vegeta's hand completely. He screams in pain, and now angered, he tries to launch a blast with his other hand. Yamcha and Shinon and Krillin counter it. As Goku flips over the blast, getting behind Vegeta and grabbing onto his tail. Vegeta brings Goku to his knees by hitting him with his elbow, chuckling as he does so. Did Kakarot really think that would work? That cheap trick of grabbing someone's tail? Vegeta's trained his tail to the point where it doesn't hurt if someone grabs it. What a foolish trick. But on the ground, Goku's still holding onto the tail. And that's not the reason he grabbed it for. As the tail's held out, Gohan rushes by, slicing it off. With Vegeta once again shrieking in pain. Now he's at a disadvantage. He's cut his power down by trying to create the artificial moon. His hand is broken, and now he doesn't have a tail so even if he wanted to transform, he couldn't. They gave him multiple handicaps, and they may actually be able to win this now. But slowly, he's been getting angrier and angrier throughout the fight. Their dirty tricks are pissing him off. Really, they're just good strategies, but still, naturally they're going to anger him. They put him at a disadvantage in every way possible. Fine, if this is how they're going to do it, he'll fight them individually. First, he goes right for Goku, aiming to only hurt him. This is a much better strategy, and he's actually able to deal some great damage towards him, easily knocking him aside. Next, he aims for Chi-Chi, doing the same. He slowly goes on the ladder of power, injuring Piccolo next, and then going for the humans. Thinking Gohan's the weakest, he saves him for last. He's blinded by his rage and not thinking clearly, but it seems he's overcoming everyone. But just as Vegeta's getting angrier, Gohan's getting angrier too, watching all of his friends fall like this, especially his parents. He wasn't able to access it during the training, but he feels that rage from before, that same rage he felt against Raditz. With all the fighters out of his way, Vegeta decides he's going to kill them one by one now. He'll start with the humans. They seem pretty weak, so it won't take a lot of energy. He charges a single blast in his hand, but as he does, he's then hit in the back by a powerful attack. Then more powerful attacks. He keeps getting punched and punched, and he doesn't know who's doing it. He turns around and sees no one there, and then gets kicked in the back of the head. Throwing him into the ground, flying across it. He gets up and sees someone standing there. It's Gohan, that child from before. Was that him who attacked? There's no way. How could a kid be so strong? But Vegeta remembers. He's a hybrid Saiyan. Of course, it's just like he theorized. A hybrid Saiyan must be stronger than a regular one. Briefly, the two of them begin to clash. Gohan's rage slowly subsides during the fight, but he's able to do some good damage to Vegeta. But ultimately, he's not able to win here. And now Vegeta's really furious. But it's not over yet. He knows a way to end this and claim victory. A simple maneuver called blowing up the planet. It's no big deal. He'll launch a blast right at Earth's core, then going back to his ship and escaping, leaving everyone else here to die. It's a shame because a fight would have been a lot more fun, but they're going to have to die regardless, and Vegeta doesn't care how they go. Charging energy into his other hand, Vegeta jumps up high into the sky. He's surrounded by a purple glow, as his hand electrifies. Normally, he'd require two hands for this attack, but one should be enough. He tells everyone to prepare for his signature move, the Gallic Gun. Although this time, a one-handed Gallic Gun. He cocks his hand back, charging more energy, launching a massive purple blast right towards the surface of Earth. All the fighters on the surface watch on weakly as this blast comes closer. Even though they're injured, they still got some fight left in them. Vegeta only temporarily took them out of the fight. By now, they've recollected themselves, and they're ready to defend Earth. Goku's the first to jump in with a Kamehameha, with Chi-Chi then joining him. The spousal Kamehameha briefly deflects the one-handed Gallic gun, but Vegeta's attack slowly gets stronger and stronger, overpowering the beat. But another blast is added, the spousal Kamehameha turned into a family Kamehameha, with Gohan now joining in. Sure, he doesn't have the same strength from his rage before, but his regular power is good enough. Vegeta's beam is still getting closer to Earth, but they've slowed it down just enough. One of the good things about Vegeta's strategy is that he thinks everyone else is knocked out, and it's just these three now. 
but really, Piccolo's been nearby planning an attack. He's faked being unconscious, but Vegeta didn't notice that he placed two fingers on his head, beginning to charge a certain attack. Vegeta's beam slowly gets closer and closer to Earth as the family struggles to defend against it, but suddenly they see a laser beam fly over their blast, one with swirling energy flying around it. Piccolo's been charging this for a while, and he knows it probably won't be enough to kill Vegeta, but it should be enough to injure him. The Makanko Sapo. This beam flies right over the Kamehameha into the Gallic Gun, swirling around it as it hits Vegeta's hand head on. Damn! Vegeta succumbed to the same trick once more. This direct blast destroyed his other hand, now giving him two broken hands, and with that, his Gallic Gun stops firing, and he's hit head on by the family Kamehameha. Vegeta's knocked high up into the sky, taking the blast at full force. They stop firing as the prince falls down to the ground, with his armor partially broken and smoke coming off of him. He crashes into a cliff nearby, and everyone flies over to go see him. It seems that Vegeta's finally been defeated, and now they're going to have to finish the job. They get over to the area and see him laying on the ground in a crater, injured but not unconscious. And surprisingly, he smirks. He begins chuckling, actually. He never expected this. He didn't think that he'd be defeated by such lowlifes. But he's come to realize that he's been going about this all wrong. Sure, he's angered inside, and he has a great hatred for these Earthlings and the Saiyans and the Namekian, but after experiencing this power, he had a great idea. Originally, they wanted to get Kakarot so he could help defeat Frieza, and Vegeta does still want that. As much as he'd love to defeat these Earthlings, Frieza's the real enemy here. Weakly, he stands up, ready to use his final bargaining chip. He asks them one simple question, have they ever heard of Frieza? Well, no, they don't know anything about aliens. Well, besides the Saiyans, of course. And now the Namekians too, I guess. But no, they don't know who this Frieza guy is. Vegeta begins explaining, and says the whole reason they came to Earth in the first place was to recruit Kakarot. Sure, they would have loved another evil Saiyan just like them, but more importantly, they wanted someone to help them defeat Frieza. He's the real enemy, his power's simply too strong. And no matter what they do, Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz couldn't stop him. He tells them more, saying that Frieza could possibly put their planet at risk too. But they asked Vegeta, how would he even know about Earth? I mean, if Earth really were that high of a priority, he would have surely come here by now, right? That is true, but Vegeta tells them, Frieza's gonna be wondering where he is. If he dies here and doesn't return, he'll find out that he died on Earth somehow, meaning there was some strong fighter there that was able to defeat him, and that'll probably put their planet on Frieza's radar. So if he doesn't return in one piece, this planet's probably gonna be destroyed. They can kill him, but he just wants them to know that, prepare for Frieza's arrival just in case. But there is another option. They could spare him and join him. Sure, he knows by now that they don't want to join his plans. They think Vegeta's evil as well as Nappa and Raditz. But he tells them they'd be fighting for a good cause. Of course, their morals don't align. They're complete polar opposites. But they'd be doing the universe a favor, and they'd be taking a precaution to help defend Earth. He can help them get stronger. He can lead them to Frieza for a preemptive strike. And he'll even join them too. Of course, they have no reason to trust him, and he knows this. If they want to kill him right now, he's fine with that. Angered, sure, but if this is where he dies, then so be it. But he asked them again, join him and help defeat Frieza. After hearing Vegeta's tale about Frieza, the group begins considering. They don't really know what they should do here. Vegeta could just be pulling their leg, but he seems really serious about it. And I mean, think about it too. Vegeta lost here, and he's in a pretty bad state right now. If he was lying, well, they could just defeat him again and kill him that time. Vegeta knows what spot he's in. He wouldn't really have any reason to lie. This is his last bargaining chip, the only way he could actually survive. Goku decides for everyone thinking that it might be best to show Vegeta some mercy. Not because he forgives Vegeta or anything, but because he knows that he's telling the truth. He listens to his intuition and tells everyone the same. They're not too sure either, but they'll go with his word. Plus, everything they discussed before makes them feel more confident. If Vegeta does lash out somehow, they can always win again. Especially because he'll be alone this time, and more injured. Here's the thing too, Vegeta lost his tail on that fight, meaning he can no longer turn into a great ape if he wants to. He thinks it might regenerate if he keeps healing, but that's not actually going to happen this time. We saw this with the Namek arc where it didn't actually grow back. So, it's going to be the same here. Vegeta is also in a pretty bad shape right now. I mean, he was almost beaten to death. So he's not in any condition to fight. It's going to take a lot of time for him to heal, but at least he has some good medical technology on Earth. Sure, it won't be as fast as his healing pods back on Frieza's planet, but at least it's something. They try and get more info about him, and Vegeta begins telling more about Frieza. He tells him training would be good either way. If they choose, they can go right for Frieza and kill him after training. Or they could just do it as a precaution. I mean, it's not like they were going to stop training anyways, but this serves as better motivation. Plus, Vegeta has some better ideas for how they could train. Earth's gravity is kind of weak in comparison. 
It's only a tenth of what the gravity on planet Vegeta was, which explains why Goku grew up so weak. Well, weak in comparison to Vegeta, not weak in comparison to everyone else. He feels they would benefit from gravity training, especially the Saiyans. Obviously, they don't really have any way of doing that right now, but Bulma could help. She proposes a room that increases the gravity around everyone while they're training, making it so that they're heavier in that room. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. They go along with that, waiting for Bulma to finish this device. Vegeta is giving them tips and more info about Frieza, but he's still cautious though. He's wondering, how did Chi-Chi get here? Clearly there were a handful of Saiyans off planet Vegeta at the time that it exploded. But this is weird, two Saiyans on the same planet. He knows that Kakarot was sent here, that's what Raditz told him. But Chi-Chi? Where did she come from? He decides to question them. Even though Kakarot may not remember his Saiyan past, maybe Chi-Chi knows something. Vegeta asks and Goku jumps in lying, saying they're not sure how she got here. He finds it out that both of them don't have their memories. I mean, Kakarot has an excuse, but Chi-Chi doesn't really have one. Goku continues lying and is eventually able to convince Vegeta. Chi-Chi's wondering why he did this, but then realizes it's because they don't want Vegeta knowing about the Dragon Balls, at least not yet. He doesn't really need to know, and if they know that Chi-Chi wished to be a Saiyan, well, he might be pretty mad about that. They obviously don't know for sure, but it's better not to take that risk. Goku was looking out for her to make sure that this wouldn't happen helping her formulate some sort of lie for Vegeta. As Vegeta continues healing, everyone starts their training once the gravity chamber is made. It surprisingly didn't take that long for Bulma to make it, which is good because they can start training right away. The humans have a tough time at first, but they eventually get acclimated to it. As for the Saiyans, Goku, Chi-Chi, and Gohan, it's a lot easier. They are already pretty strong, and they grow remarkably fast in there. Piccolo seems to adjust pretty well to it too. He's stronger than the humans after all, and he's familiar with harsh training. That's kind of his whole thing. So, what did they decide to do about Frieza? Well, what Vegeta said convinced them. They are training as a precaution. They have no idea where his planet is or if he's even there. And even if they did, they'd have no way to get there. And on top of that, even if they could get there, they don't know how strong this guy is. He could be way stronger than Vegeta's letting on, because Vegeta doesn't even know his full power either. So not only is it a massive feat right now to overcome, but it's pretty risky too. There are so many variables that they can't account for, and so many unknowns that they don't know yet. But hey, training as a precaution is good. If Frieza doesn't come to Earth, well, great, they're stronger by default. And if he does, they'll be prepared. Although, they don't really know what they're preparing for. But whatever, it's better to get more rigorous training nonetheless. So, what is Frieza doing? Well, he does assume Vegeta's dead, because he doesn't return. Of course, Frieza wouldn't really care either way. Vegeta's dead? Great, he didn't really like that guy anyways. But still, if someone was strong enough to kill him, well, that could be a problem in the future. I mean, whoever killed Vegeta and his two Saiyan friends, well, they did Frieza a favor. Three less Saiyans in the universe, but it gets him to thinking. Who could be so strong to do this, especially in such a planet that he's never heard of? He begins researching, trying to figure out where Vegeta went and what happened. And luckily he has a pretty good source, that being Kui, Vegeta's natural rival. The two do hate each other a lot, so Kui does this to spite Vegeta, giving Frieza whatever information he wants. Although, he doesn't really know that much himself, but it's more than enough to help Frieza. He begins working, trying to find out whatever planet Vegeta went to, and trying to find out what even is on there. Obviously, he doesn't know about the Dragon Balls either. Really, he's more interested in the fighters there. If there's such strong people on that planet, it might be pretty valuable. After all, with people so strong, they might be defending something pretty valuable. Even better, if Frieza decides not to kill them, he can enslave them. More people for his army, strong soldiers too. Either way, it could be useful. No one on Earth knows if or when Frieza will come, as I mentioned before. So, a few months pass. Their training continues and eventually, Vegeta's fully healed, now training with everyone. He got a nice boost in power from healing, although it did take a long time. Him almost dying actually did help. They're eventually able to get him a Senzu Bean once they trust him enough, speeding up that healing process and letting him train with them. He gets a pretty nice boost from his Saiyan power. And you might think Goku, Chi Chi, and Gohan would benefit from that too, but not really. They're not training near death after all. They're training pretty rigorously, but not that rigorously. They are aware of the Saiyan power though, but since healing resources are so sparse, well, they're not gonna really take the risk and abuse it. Maybe if they find a better way to heal, but that's further down the line. Right now, they're focused on this training, but this boost in power for Vegeta lets him jump in right away. And let's actually cover some powers after these few months pass. Goku and Chi-Chi are about even. I mean, they are training at the same rate and with the same partners, using the same strategies and all. They're both at a power of 1.5 million each. Vegeta's close behind them. His boost in power really did help him. Plus, his training was pretty intense too, allowing him to incorporate really good strategies that he's used before for training, putting him up at a power of 1 million. Right behind him is Gohan, at around 900,000. 
As we covered, he has much more of a fighting spirit this time. Plus, both of his parents are encouraging him to train, so he'll be training here. His growth as a hybrid Saiyan really helps as well. Piccolo's behind him at 800,000. Next, we have Tenshinhan at 500,000, followed by Krillin at 450,000, and Yamcha at 400,000. Obviously, they didn't benefit from this as much as the Saiyans, but still, gravity training really helped them. They're way stronger than they were in the original series, and I don't think I have to tell you guys that that's really good. The reason we're doing this short time skip though is because Frieza eventually finds Earth in this time. After all his research, he found out where Vegeta went to and where it's located. Maybe people aren't really that strong there. I mean, if they were, Vegeta probably would have called for help, meaning he was probably confident about fighting everyone. Frieza doesn't really want to bother himself right now, so he sends some ships to Earth. Zarbon and Adoria should be enough. They're fine soldiers, and they'll be more than enough to take on any Earthlings. The two of them are sent to the planet first. Hui goes along too just to see if Vegeta's actually dead. Imagine if they find him alive somehow, that would be pretty funny. The three of them go there, descending on Earth. They don't want to make too much noise just yet, so they use their scouter searching around, and they find one strong power in a wasteland nearby, going towards it and realizing that it's Vegeta. Vegeta knew that they were arriving, he sensed them in outer space, and powered up to draw them out. Now he actually knows how to sense key and control his key. Pretty useful because he has them alone. He turns to Kui, asking if this was all his doing. Kui laughs and confirms this, as Vegeta slowly lifts one of his fingers up, launching a beam that kills Kui instantly. Zarbon and Hidori are surprised. Sure, he wasn't as strong as them, but still, Vegeta killed him in one shot. So it's you! I see. They begin questioning Vegeta, asking how he's still alive and why he's here, but Vegeta doesn't answer. He tells him he doesn't need to. They ask him again, saying they'll just kill him if he doesn't say anything, and blow up this planet in the process. Well, Vegeta accepts playing like that. He lifts up his hand once again, blasting off their scouters. And the two of them go into fight, with Zarbon even transforming. As they get closer, Vegeta chuckles, sticking out one hand at each of them. And with a single blast charge in each, he eradicates both of them. Just as Frieza expected, this might be trouble. And even more interesting, Vegeta's still alive and apparently a lot stronger. This might require some more special forces. Frieza sends some forces into Earth, as well as setting up a temporary base on the moon so he can operate from there. If he really feels like it, he'll just blow up Earth with a single finger. But he may as well try this first. He sends in the Ginyu Force next. And since Vegeta already had his fun, the humans decide they want to fight this time. Vegeta informs them of the Ginyu Force's strategies, and they take it into account. The Ginyu Force are a lot louder once they arrive on Earth, actually attacking a city instead. In order to draw out any fighters, the humans arrive at the city, stopping this attack really quickly. And right away, they make pretty quick work of the Ginyu Force. They know Goldo's time stop is a threat, so they kill him first. Then going after Jason Birder, and finally Raku. But they quickly come to learn of Ginyu's body change. Using his scouter, he's able to find out which of them is the strongest, that being Ten Shinhan, stealing his body and injuring his previous one in the process. They're not too sure what to do right now, but Yamcha steps in, deciding he'll fight. He knows all Ten Shinhan's moves, and it seems Ginyu got pretty weak after switching bodies, not being able to use Ten's full power. He fills Krillin on his plan, and Krillin agrees. Yamcha begins fighting, being able to keep up with Ginyu pretty easily. Krillin comes in too, lending some support. And they're able to beat Ginyu up pretty badly, but not killing him in order to preserve the body. The whole point of this is to try and put him in a corner, and as you'd expect, it does push him into a corner, forcing him to swap bodies once again, just as they planned. As he does this, they throw Ginyu's old body upwards, returning the bodies back to their normal owners, and killing Ginyu as soon as they have the chance. Ten's back in his original body, and it is injured quite a bit but otherwise he's okay. Yamcha and Krillin lead him away so they can go patch him up. And now with the Ginyu Force defeated, there's only one other possible person that can come attack Earth. Frieza finally arrives, realizing that his forces are outmatched. He was watching from that temporary base on the moon, and yeah, he could have blown up Earth really easily, but it didn't really seem that fun. He hasn't had a chance to fight in a while, and it would be pretty fun to personally kill Vegeta and all his friends. Plus, he doesn't really want to stay on this moon any longer. There was some weird rabbit guy living on here. Anyways, Frieza goes to Earth, and the group's actually pretty surprised. He's a lot smaller than they expected, but Vegeta obviously knows what he looks like. Vegeta eggs Frieza on, ready to fight. The group feels pretty confident. In his first form, Frieza's not really that strong in comparison. Piccolo fights him and gets the upper hand really quickly, forcing Frieza to go into his second form. Vegeta joins in, forming an alliance with Piccolo. They did train a bit together, and their personalities kind of did mesh in the scenario, so they're kind of pals. Also, a Vegeta and Piccolo team-up is really cool and we don't really see it that much, so I'm taking the chance here. I'd be crazy not to. Anyways, they fight Frieza together, even forcing him into his third form. 
Frieza surprised. He knew they were strong, but not this strong. He should be the one on top. This is an insult to him, if anything. Whatever, he still has one more form up his sleeve, going to his fourth form, his true and final form. This is where things get a lot trickier. Now, it can't just be Vegeta and Piccolo fighting. Everyone else jumps in too. Frieza's outnumbered, but not at all overpowered. The group intervenes right away, not spending any time talking to it. It's a pretty intense fight as you expect, but even with everyone involved, Frieza's just simply too strong. Since Vegeta is his main target after all, and the one person that he hates most in this group, he decides to attack Vegeta first. He launches a beam at Vegeta, going right through him, gravely injuring the prince. He weakly props himself up, telling the group he'll survive, just wanting them to kill Frieza and not focus on him. Yamcha and Ten are in the fight because they're still healing from their fight with the Ginyu Force. But Krillin's here and he decides to take Vegeta away in order to protect him. Frieza almost launches another beam right at Krillin, but Goku then comes in and punches Frieza, knocking him right towards Chi-Chi who kicks him. Ah, so this is the problem. There were two more Saiyans on Earth. And coincidentally, male and female. And they had a child. Disgusting. He can't let these Saiyans live any longer. They're procreating. The thought of these monkeys doing that sickens him. The group's equally weirded out. Why is Frieza so obsessed with Saiyans doing that? What a freak, is that all he thinks about? Jokes aside, the fight continues. And even with their great power-ups for training, they're still not enough to defeat Frieza. Piccolo ends up getting injured next leaving just Goku, Chi-Chi, and Gohan. Frieza goes for Goku first, knocking the other two away and purposefully beating up Goku. Goku tries to fight back, but he can't. Frieza's simply too strong. Even though they did train as a precaution, it wasn't enough. Goku actually chuckles a bit. Vegeta was right, but even with Vegeta's help, they still weren't able to win. Although he's not going to accept defeat right yet, he continues trying to fight back, even though it's fruitless. Frieza's suddenly hit in the back of the head by a powerful attack from Gohan. He's angered by watching Goku get beat up. And in this temporary state of rage with this boost in power, Gohan attacks Frieza. Frieza fends him off at first, but Gohan eventually gets some good hits in. He doesn't know what happened. Sure, this kid's a Saiyan and all, but how is a kid so strong? Whatever, he seems like a pest anyways. Frieza decides to just kill him on the spot, not holding back at all. As Gohan continues to punch Frieza, Frieza then grabs him by his hair, throwing Gohan up in the sky. Frieza sticks out a single finger, hitting Gohan on the arm with a death beat. Then another, then another. Goku and Chi-Chi watch on in horror, with Piccolo there trying to help as well. But they can't do anything. Anytime they move, Frieza launches a compressed blast of air that knocks them all away. And finally, Frieza finishes off Gohan with a massive blast, killing him and completely wiping him off the face of the earth. Just around this time, Krillin's flying back in with a bag of Senzu beans. Not only was he sensing what's happening, but he actually got to see it close up too. But even scarier, he senses a weird new power. He looks down and sees. It's not coming from Piccolo, no. Goku and Chi-Chi. Their powers are rising, exponentially, and although they were just on the ground a moment ago, they stand up. Frieza watches from nearby too, seeing that they actually have a bit of fight left in them. How cute, they think they're going to avenge that brat. But Frieza's cockiness suddenly wears off. The ground begins shaking around everyone, with Piccolo watching on too. Back at Capsule Corp, Vegeta's sensing everything that's happening. This power, there's no way. The couple then lets out a scream, as they're both coated in the same golden aura. Now massively stronger, and with their hair turning gold, Frieza is absolutely speechless and terrified. No, it can't be. The one thing he feared most. He caused it to happen, and not just one of them. No, he brought two into existence. In front of him stands his worst nightmares. Two of the legendary Super Saiyans. Frieza looks on in awe. He can't believe it. The sheer power coming off of these two, it's insane. There's no doubt in his mind about it. The two people standing in front of him right now are Super Saiyans. Both Goku and Chi-Chi are overcome with rage and sadness, but also feeling confusion, now having this new state of power. They don't necessarily know what just happened, but they look at each other and see. Both have golden hair, blue eyes, and their hair spiked up. Although injured, Vegeta decides to fly over to see what's happening, with the rest of the group following suit as well. They know that they're not going to be able to fight, but they want to see what they're actually sensing right now. Vegeta is the most shocked of all. For the first time ever, he's seeing a Super Saiyan right in front of him, and not just one, two of them. It's incredible. The presence itself is just overwhelming. And if that's how Vegeta reacts, you can imagine how Frieza would react. He'd be terrified and realizes he might be screwed here. He looks down at his hand and notices it's trembling. The great emperor, Frieza, is shaking in fear. He has to calm himself. This isn't the end. Just because there's two Super Saiyans in front of him doesn't mean he can't win. He still hasn't shown off his full power. Out of desperation, he begins bulking up showing off the true extent of the power in his final form. These two might have transformed, yeah, but they won't beat him. 
Right away, both Goku and Chi-Chi lunge over towards Frieza, hitting him simultaneously, with Frieza trying to block it with both arms. The punches cause a massive shockwave, and Frieza drops his arms down. They're both shaking. He actually feels pain. There's no way this is happening. No way he's being overpowered. Before he can even collect his thoughts, the two begin attacking him again. Naturally, they fight with perfect synergy. They've trained together for years, and both are masters of martial arts and fighting in general. There's no way Frieza could win here. He's outnumbered, he's overpowered, and he's outmatched in terms of strategy and technique. And surprisingly enough, even after the loss of Gohan, the two are keeping their composure. They're not going to slip up due to pure anger or whatever. They know that they have to keep themselves in control in order to defeat Frieza. There is no opening for him to exploit, so he'll have to create one. And he has the perfect idea. As the two briefly jump back and charge another attack, Frieza quickly lifts his arm up, charging a massive blast in his hands, throwing it right down towards Earth. If this hits the planet, the entire place will explode. But that's not his intention here. This is a distraction. Goku's quick enough to jump in and try and stop the attack. With a single blast, he counters Frieza's. With Chi-Chi then lunging in towards the Emperor. And this is just what he needed. An opening, he just needed one of them to go away. Frieza then charges another massive blast in his hands, launching it at Chi-Chi using his full power. It's a direct hit. A giant beam comes out of his hands, and he thinks he's killed her. But really, once the blast dissipates, She's standing there with her arms up, blocking the blast, and she's actually fine. He can't even take on one of them alone. The couple knows that they need to finish this right now before he does anything else desperate. But it's already too late. Frieza decided that if he's gonna go down, he's gonna at least take someone else with him. And nearby he sees the perfect prey, Vegeta and Piccolo. He launches a beam towards them, and Vegeta prepares to counter it with his own, but Piccolo jumps in, knocking Vegeta out of the way and taking the blast head on. Frieza wasn't able to kill Vegeta, but he was able to kill Piccolo. And before he can even do anything else, he's hit in the face by Goku who jumps back up. The two fight him together and are prepared to kill him. They have no intention of sparing him at all. The two stand side to side, drawing their hands back as they charge energy. Frieza launches one last blast in desperation, but it does nothing. Before it can hit them, it's overwhelmed by their combined Kamehameha, easily destroying Frieza's blast and then killing the Emperor. The two of them won, but still, at what cost? They lost Gohan, they lost Piccolo, one of their friends. And the worst part is, they can't revive either of them. It's over. With Piccolo gone, that means Kami's gone too. Three people dead, three people that they can't bring back. They defended Earth and at least defended all the others. But they don't know how to feel. Two power down. Still unsure of what that power was, but at least thankful that it helped them overcome Frieza. Everyone looks to see the aftermath. And they're trying to think of what to do next. But Krillin comes up with a great idea. Piccolo's an alien, right? Well, wouldn't that mean there's probably Dragon Balls on whatever planet he came from? It's a long shot, but maybe it could work. Goku and Chi-Chi are surprised to hear this. They didn't even consider that. Krillin might be right. They have a shot at bringing everyone back. Plus, some of Frieza's ships are still on Earth, so they might be able to get to outer space somehow. Yeah, the more they think about it, maybe there is hope. They begin planning immediately, not wanting to waste any time at all. Bulma's glad to help too, and as she's trying to plan, she discovers that there's some ships on the moon apparently. If you remember I mentioned in the last part, Frieza set up a temporary base on the moon, and Bulma sees this and thinks it's awesome. She's gonna take this for herself, I mean, an entire base on the moon? That's awesome! That'll not only make space travel easier for them, but she can probably use it for research somehow, not to mention any of the technology there. Speaking of the tech there, there are rejuvenation chambers, the kinds that Vegeta used to use to heal himself after missions, which is great, because they're able to use it to heal everyone on Earth. They don't need Senzu beans or anything. Sure, it does take a bit of time, but it works. Everything's lining up in place. It might all go well. After some brief planning, the ships are ready to go to Namek. And with how advanced Frieza's ships are, it would get to Namek pretty quickly. It wouldn't be like Bulma's ship where it takes a few weeks. This trip would probably take a couple days at most. And the great thing is, there's no Frieza force in space to worry about, right? They assume that all the Frieza force is gone. I mean, they did defeat most of them after all, at least the strong ones. But really, there is one last loose end, one that they'll encounter soon enough. That being King Cold. Of course, he'd be aware of what happened on Earth. And after finding out about Frieza's defeat, he decides to follow these people into space. All that remains of the Frieza force is him and a couple soldiers. But it shouldn't be a big deal. He alone should be able to take them out. He aims for revenge. Soon enough, the ship lands on Namek. And everything seems pretty peaceful. The Namekians are surprised to see these new visitors, not knowing of who they are or where they come from but they explain everything, including the fact that two Namekians live on Earth, or at least they did live there until they died, and that's the whole reason they're here. They want to revive those Namekians, as well as Gohan who was killed by Frieza. 
It seems that they're in luck. The Namekians are glad to help them. These people seem like they have good intentions. They did defeat one of the most evil people in the universe after all, and they're only here to revive someone. Not to mention, one of the people that they're trying to revive is a Namekian, and they'd be glad to help out one of their own. Unfortunately, it's not going to be that easy. Eventually, King Cole does track them down, having followed them in space and then finding out where they went, planet Namek. He doesn't know why they went there, but he doesn't really care either. All he knows is this means that he has an opportunity to kill them. Not long after, King Cole's ship descends on the planet, and the Namekians are curious to see this other visitor. He lands near a village that's kind of far away from where Goku and his crew are. But even though they're miles away, Goku and Chi-Chi can sense what's happening, as well as everyone else in their group. And Vegeta immediately knows who this is. He thinks that King Cold's here, trying to seek revenge for Frieza. The group drops what they're doing and immediately they head over. King Gold puts on a scouter, trying to see where everyone else is. This just seems like a regular Namekian village. There's no Saiyans or Earthlings here. He asks if they can point him in the right direction, and if they don't, he'll kill them. Of course, they're not going to give up where those people are. They're terrified, but they're willing to make a stand against King Cold. Alright, looks like he's going to have to kill them then. He lifts up a finger, charging a beam. He launches a laser at the Elder of the village. And before he can even react, the beam is swatted away. And the Elder is standing there completely fine. King Cold doesn't know what just happened, but then he sees. Luckily enough, Goku and his group were able to make it here in time. King Cold chuckles. They did the work for him. This is great. He tells him not to worry. He's going to make this quick. The Namekians are all terrified, not knowing what's going to happen next. Krillin, Tenshinhan, Yamcha, and Vegeta watch on. With Vegeta laughing in response, King Cold sees that he's there, surprised to see that Vegeta's part of the group. So it appears the rumors were true, Vegeta's a turncoat. But Vegeta tells King Cold he shouldn't focus on that right now, he's in the presence of two Super Saiyans. King Cold tells Vegeta not to make him laugh, he's calling himself a Super Saiyan, and who's the other one? But Vegeta points over, Goku and Chi-Chi, those two will be the ones to defeat King Cold just like they are able to defeat Frieza. He thinks this is a bluff, but then they transform immediately, going into Super Saiyan. It took a couple days, but in their training on the way to Namek, they were able to figure out how to access Super Saiyan at will again. The form is still in its very early stages, but they now have use of it whenever they need. And while King Cold is distracted by those two, Krillin then yells out to him. Cold looks over and immediately he's blinded, as Krillin performs a solar flare. This leaves an easy opening for Goku and Chi Chi. As Vegeta then runs up King King Cold square in the chin, knocking him away as Goku then flies behind him and catches him, delivering a kick that knocks him into the air with a sonic boot. Chi-Chi then jumps up quickly, and as King Cold's vision returns, the last thing he sees is Chi-Chi right in front of him, charging a blast. And before he can even get his guard up, it's over. The blast flies clean across the atmosphere, killing King Cold without a trace. There are some Frieza soldiers remaining, but luckily Vegeta is able to take them out pretty easily. He's kind of pissed he couldn't fight King Cold or something, but still, at least this is something. And now the Frieza force is fully wiped out. The Namekians don't really know how to feel. I mean, they did lead these enemies right to their planet. But it wasn't really that big of a deal because they defeated those enemies right away. And now they don't have to worry about them anymore. If anything, it just proves that these people are good. So, whatever. They let it slide. Everyone's able to get the Dragon Balls, and they summon Paranga. There is a catch, though. They have three wishes, but they're not going to be able to revive everyone with one wish. They would need one separate wish each for Gohan and Piccolo, and then another wish to bring them back to Earth. But that's not a problem. They hear a voice in their head telling them what to do, only saying to revive Piccolo and Gohan right now, not worrying about bringing them back to Earth. They don't know what voice they're hearing, but then he introduces himself. It's a man named King Kai. After Piccolo and Gohan died, King Yama directed them to this place, King Kai's planet. He's been watching everything that's been going on. And after those two died, he decided he was going to train them. They've been here for a few weeks at this rate and they're making some nice progress, but he feels they need some more time. Right now they can revive them with Paranga, that's fine, but he doesn't want them going to Earth just yet. He'll send them back once they're ready, and with the help of Kami, that won't take too long. Oh, well, they're surprised to hear this, but okay. That sounds cool. They got their own training while they were dead. Interesting. Paranga revives both of them with a wish, only using up two of his three wishes, because Piccolo and Kami are revived together. They all thank the Namekians and they leave, going back to Earth and looking forward to seeing Gohan again. Eventually, Gohan and Piccolo are sent back to Earth, a few weeks later, and they have a really interesting new technique called Kaioken. It allows them to multiply their power during battle. It's pretty strenuous, but it's useful, especially for someone like Piccolo who doesn't have a transformation. Not to mention alongside that, they got some regular training in regardless. This planet had 10 times the gravity of Earth, making them a lot stronger, not to mention running along Snake Way, although that didn't take nearly as long for them as it did for Goku in the original story. I mean, they could pretty effortlessly fly after all. And the gravity wasn't too big of an adjustment either, it's not their first time dealing with something like that. But regardless, all this training was helpful. 
Piccolo focused on learning Kaioken, while Gohan did learn it, but was more focused on another technique that King Kai had. Something called a spirit bomb, but luckily he won't need to use that anytime soon. And for now, things go back to normal on Earth, with everyone continuing their training, and with Bulma enjoying her new space station. Let's go forward a bit, about a year or so. Goku, Chi Chi, and Gohan are at home. Goku and Gohan are training together, while Chi Chi's there taking care of a newborn child, Goten. He was born earlier in the scenario due to all the peace time, but that peace may be ending soon. They're called over to Capsule Corp, Bulma says it's urgent, and they weren't the only ones called over. All the other fighters are called over too. And when they get there, they see something really weird. First off, Bulma's pregnant. Oh, having a kid with Yamcha? Nope, it's actually Vegeta's kid. That's weird, but whatever. They're more interested in these two visitors. There's two other people there with Bulma. As for one of them, they don't know who he is, but the other one looks kind of familiar in a way. They introduce themselves, with everyone shocked to hear their names. One of them is named Trunks, which is weird because Bulma was thinking about naming her kid that. And now that he mentions it, his hair, it does kind of look like hers. But more importantly, the other one, the guy that looks pretty familiar. His name is Goten. Okay, what's going on here? Well, they begin explaining further. They're time travelers. They're from the future and they came in the past to try and save their timeline. And since Goten's already born and Trunks is going to be born soon, they have no need to hide their identities. And by the way, I want to note something interesting. Goten is a full Saiyan. He's the first full Saiyan to be born on Earth. And since he's not a hybrid, I'm going to make him a bit different than normal. They begin going into their biography. In their timeline, Goku ended up dying of a heart virus. And if that wasn't bad enough, eventually the Red Ribbon Army sent androids to attack. Their fighters were pretty strong, and they did do some damage. With Chi Chi as a Super Saiyan, that was still helpful. But even she couldn't defeat the androids. Piccolo with his Kaioken, that didn't work either. And all the fighters ended up falling, except for Gohan. Gohan grew up, eventually being the one to help train Goten and Trunks. He saw potential in these two. Trunks was the hybrid just like him, and as for Goten, well, he was a lot less like Gohan. He's biologically wired to be more like Vegeta, for example, since he's a pure Saiyan, even with how he's raised. He's a lot more ready for battle, and Gohan was glad to train them. He was trying to get them to get Super Saiyan, but nothing was working. Eventually, he ended up falling against the androids. In his final battle, he actually put up a good fight. They did have the gravity chamber after all for all the training. He got a lot stronger in that time period, and after the death of everyone else, he was able to get Super Saiyan for himself. Against the androids, he had one last trump card, his spirit bomb. But sadly, it wasn't enough. He was able to charge one up, launching it at the androids. But there wasn't much energy for him on Earth to use. After he launched it, he powered up into Super Saiyan, trying to push it towards them. And the two did take some damage, but eventually they were able to overpower it. With the spirit bomb exploding, and the two androids going to kill Gohan. They were so close to victory, but still so far. And that leads them to where they are today. Goten and Trunks have come into the past to warn everyone of the androids, as well as giving Goku heart virus medicine. They hope that by doing so, this will prevent everything in the future from happening. And hopefully they can restore their timeline. They're not too sure though. It might not actually work, but it's worth a shot at least. They're about to leave, but before they go, Goku and Chi Chi ask something, specifically asking Goten. They were about to head back to their timeline, but before they do, Goku and Chi Chi want to test Goten's power, seeing where he is in terms of strength. Well, no way he's going to turn out a fight. The three of them all transform into Super Saiyan. Goten feels confident that he can take on both of them alone, and right when he transforms, they can tell he's a pretty powerful opponent. He does have a pretty tough time against the two of them together, but the fact that he can manage this at all is impressive enough. It seems that both of them combined are actually stronger than him. But individually, Goten's actually stronger, and Trunks is at a similar level. Wow, seems like they have a lot of training to do, especially getting a better grasp on Super Saiyan. But with that brief sparring match out of the way, Trunks and Goten thank everyone, heading back to their timeline once more, hoping that things are going to turn out for the best. And now we get into the three years of training before the androids arrive. What new methods of training can they employ that they haven't done before? I mean, there's gravity training, but they've done that. Even if they crank it up to higher levels, what's the difference? They've pretty much exhausted all of their earthly options, but that gets Bulma thinking. Gravity training, a different place that isn't Earth. She has the perfect idea, the moon. Wait, the moon? They're gonna train in a place with lower gravity than Earth? Well, no, the great thing is there, they won't need to worry about destroying anything. Well, they're gonna have to make sure not to destroy the moon or leave any huge marks. But Bulma will have a lot more space there to build a training facility instead of using the regular ones that they have on Earth. And they can have some fun sparring matches in space while fighting in zero gravity, or at least the low gravity of the moon. They won't even need a suit, she can set up a temporary atmosphere. And she can make a device that manipulates the entire gravity of the moon as a whole, rather than just one part of it. Think of it as a giant gravity room, or gravity moon if you will. Huh, this is kind of weird, but it's cool. I mean, training in space? 
That's awesome. They'd love to do that. Thanks to Bulma's quick and amazing work on her technology, this is able to be accomplished pretty easily. I mean, she could develop intergalactic space travel with very little resources. Anywho, they begin training on the moon, having all the space they need to do whatever they want. I mean, now that I think about it, is this is this ethical? Is it ethical for Bulma to turn the moon into like a giant gym? I mean, probably not. I mean, ethics and Dragon Ball don't really mix. Like, one of the main heroes, Vegeta, he's murdered like millions of people, so... I don't know. I guess it works. But we're not here to discuss ethics in Dragon Ball. We're here to discuss Chi Chi becoming a monkey man, or monkey woman, space monkey woman alien, person thing. Screw the moon, they can do whatever they want, just because it's cool. Well, with all this happening on the moon, Jocko actually finds out and wonders why Bulma is using the moon for training. He needs to keep a closer eye on Earth. I mean, these people are just taking their moons and turning them into training places. Not cool, Bulma. Anyways, with all this training, Vegeta eventually does get Super Saiyan and immediately sees an opportunity. He could try improving the form somehow, or maybe he could try learning that thing Piccolo has, Kaioken, combining it with Super Saiyan. He's beginning to think of ways to surpass Goku and Chi Chi somehow, but he doesn't fret about it too much. He knows that eventually with his great mind and great strategies, he'll come up with something. He is the great Prince Vegeta after all. And this also reminds him, thinking of how to surpass other Saiyans. Chi Chi, what's her Saiyan name? I mean, he calls Goku Kakarot, he's never going to use his Earthling name. And he only feels it's proper to use Chi Chi's Saiyan name. He never found out why she's here or how she got here, and would rather call her by her Saiyan name. He completely forgot about that mystery. He's gonna look into it some more, because something doesn't really add up here. He can't believe he almost forgot, but he'll find out soon. Anyways, all those years of training eventually pass, and they all arrive back on Earth ready to fight the androids. First up, they find Android 19 and 20 attacking a city. One of the biggest differences here is that Goku's actually able to fight. He did take his heart virus medicine, because Chi Chi was always around him and made sure he did. She's a good wife. Had she not been around, well, Goku would end up like this. It's a good thing she was always around during that training, and this makes the fight against the androids a lot easier. I mean, Vegeta was able to defeat 19 pretty easily, but having Goku and Chi-Chi there too, it makes it even easier. This means Jiro doesn't escape, and both the androids actually get defeated. But before they do, Jiro makes sure to activate the androids remotely. He made this failsafe because he knew he may be outmatched, and in case he were to die here, he wanted to be sure that the androids were activated, even if it was remote. His head is taken off. And since he's a weird robot dude, his head is still talking. His disembodied head laughs at them. He prepared the two androids just for this. He's been spying on them all along after all. Ever since Chi Chi wished to be a Saiyan, he knew he'd have to up the ante. He studied Saiyans more, learned of Super Saiyan, and had this failsafe activated. But before he could babble on any longer, he's killed. But Vegeta's just standing there in shock. Wait, wait a second. Did Jiro say what he thinks he said? No, that can't be right. Chi Chi wished to be a Saiyan? Like, with the Dragon Balls? She was a human before? In the midst of all this, Goten and Trunks show up. But before they could even say anything, Vegeta rockets off. He's pissed. He feels lied to somehow. And actually, it's pretty fair for him to feel this way. He was lied to. And it wasn't just by omission. They actually did lie to him, saying that she was a Saiyan all along. You might remember this from a few parts ago, but this whole time, Vegeta was wondering why Chi Chi was here. The fact that she wished to be a Saiyan isn't inherently harmful. I mean, it doesn't really sit well with him, but why lie about it? He's aware about the Dragon Balls right now anyways, and assumes they just didn't want him finding out beforehand. Does the group not trust him or something? Or is it something else, some big misunderstanding? All in all, he's not really too sure how to feel about it. He's feeling a mix of anger and confusion, and doesn't even know if it's a problem that really concerns him. Regardless, his opinion on the Saiyan couple is soured, and now he's off on his way to find the androids himself. The group decides it's best to do this anyways, so they all go off too trying to look for the androids, not knowing where to find them. Trunks and Piccolo chase Vegeta down, while the rest of the group goes with Goku and splits up somehow. Wondering where to find the androids, they know Goku is a target, so he keeps moving. Goten and Trunks inform them that those androids that they killed aren't actually the ones in their timeline. And eventually they get word from Piccolo that he, Vegeta, and Trunks actually did find the androids. And the fight didn't go well at all, they got demolished pretty much instantly. But thankfully the androids left them alive so they're heading back for now. So much for hunting down the androids and defeating them. It looks like they still got a ways to go in terms of power. It's surprising that they're actually strong enough to defeat someone like Vegeta who now has Super Saiyan, and Piccolo who has his own Kaioken. Same with Trunks, another Super Saiyan. But Goku actually has a pretty good idea of what to do, using the room of spirit in time. The group heads to the lookout, knowing that they also need to keep moving and this is a good spot for Goku to hide, as well as a good spot for him to train. Although, now he has to think of an order of who to train with. Well, it doesn't seem like Vegeta's coming to the lookout anytime soon. It seems he needs a few days away from the group to simmer down after finding out this thing about Chi-Chi. Luckily for Goku, that means he could head in first. He goes in with Chi-Chi. 
and the two train to perfect Super Saiyan somehow, trying to fix the stamina issues and powering it up in any way they can. And this would be pretty simple for both of them, even easier than it was for Goku and Cannon. See, when Goku trains with Gohan and Cannon, Gohan didn't know Super Saiyan before heading in. Chi Chi actually knows Super Saiyan already, which means they don't have to spend time trying to teach her that. Not to mention, with their combined knowledge on martial arts, this will help them. Not only in their training in terms of strength, but training in terms of technique, in regards to how they improve their Super Saiyan form. And as you'd probably expect, they do just that, with future Goten and Gohan heading in next. This is weird and cool for both of them at the same time. I mean, they're brothers, but not from the same timeline. Gohan sees an older version of Goten, while Goten sees a younger version of Gohan. The two get along pretty well though, and Goten feels like he's honoring future Gohan, training the younger version of Gohan is the best way to do that. He's basically acting as a messenger between the two Gohans. Gohan gets to learn more about his future self, and Goten gets to learn about his past self. Not like it's very interesting though because Goten is still a toddler in this timeline. And with their knowledge from Goku and Chi Chi, they also are able to unlock the same thing, a perfected version of Super Saiyan. Meanwhile, Goku and Chi Chi were spending time looking for the androids, and they eventually did find one, someone that had key. It was a weird green monster, and according to Trunks, that's not one of the androids that attacked his timeline. They accidentally stumbled upon Cell, who then escapes quickly, trying to find the androids himself before they can. The group now knows to keep an eye out for him. Cell is keeping a low profile as he chases the androids, and with the group so focused on their training, he's actually able to get the androids before anyone else. Right when Vegeta and Trunks head into the time chamber next, they all sense a huge burst in key, with the group heading over to where they sense it. And what they find is actually pretty scary. They see three androids, not just the two from the future timeline, but another one, Android 16, and on top of that they see another android, Cell. That same one Goku and Chi Chi found before, but it seems they arrive too late, because right when they do, Cell absorbs Android 17, turning into his semi-perfect form. 16 is destroyed and he has 18 in his hands, and the group watches as Cell transforms once more, turning into his perfect form. Luckily, Cell's a pretty fun guy to be around, so he's gonna throw a tournament, the Cell Games. I'm sure I don't have to explain that to you guys, it's pretty self-explanatory, and it's good since the group already has a head start on their training. But with Cell now in his perfect form, they're not too sure if their training's enough. They'll figure out a plan before the Cell Games though, and Piccolo actually gets a good idea. He remembers something he learned on King Kai's planet while he was there. Gohan actually learned it too, but the two of them never really had any use for it. While in Otherworld, they tried to make the most of their short time there. Piccolo got Kao Ken and Gohan got the Spirit Bomb as I mentioned last time, but they did learn another technique called Fusion, and as you could probably tell, it's not really something that they could use. It does require equal power and equal height after all, and Piccolo and Gohan are pretty much the opposite of that, well at least this point in the story, but they think they may actually have the perfect candidates to learn Fusion. Piccolo begins thinking, what would be the least weird of Fusion? Goku could fuse with Vegeta, but Vegeta doesn't really want that, he's pretty sour at Goku and Chi Chi right now, so that's out of the picture. What about Tenshinhan and Yamcha? They have similar height and power. It would work, but they're not too sure how it would work against Cell. But then Piccolo sees, it's right in front of him, the perfect candidates for fusion. The two future warriors, Goten and Trunks. They're not gonna spend the rest of their time training, they're gonna spend their time learning fusion. Piccolo thinks that's gonna be the perfect trump card. He can't believe he forgot about this until now. And over the next 10 days, everyone does their own training, with Goten and Trunks training with Piccolo and Gohan to learn fusion. Time passes and we eventually get to the Cell games, and the first person to actually face Cell is Goku. His fight actually goes pretty similar to how it went in the original story, he's mainly just trying to size Cell up. And it becomes pretty clear that he can't get too far, so the next person to fight Cell is Chi Chi. Even though Cell is still stronger than her, he's a little bit worn out from his fight with Goku, he did have to regenerate a bit and use a bit of his stamina. Sadly, unlike the other androids, he doesn't have infinite stamina, and they try to utilize this weakness. If they wear him out enough, they might actually be able to defeat him pretty easily. Chi Chi also loses, with Gohan being the next to fight him. And this fight goes differently from normal. Gohan's also there to try and wear him out. They know Gohan has power within him, but they don't want to push him and try and draw that out. Especially because Piccolo has a really good plan with that fusion thing he mentioned. Cell watches on, wondering who the next warrior is. Is it Goten? Trunks? Vegeta? Piccolo? It seems like Goten's gonna go up, but then Trunks walks up alongside him. He reminds them, it's just a one-on-one, -on -one. no cheating, he's being fair and they tell Cell not to worry, he is going to fight one person. The two then perform a fusion dance, executing it perfectly as a new figure is born. The fusion of Goten and Trunks, Gotenks. This is the first time everyone's actually seeing Gotenks, besides Piccolo and Gohan. They think it's awesome, not to mention, his power is higher than any of theirs, just in his base form alone. Cell's a bit concerned and confused, he's never seen something like this before. And to make things worse, the fusion of the half Saiyan and the Saiyan turns Super Saiyan, 
I am never going to say Saiyan that many times in a sentence ever again. While Gotenks would want to have a good fight, he knows he has to make quick work of Cell, so after a little bit of fighting, he goes in for the kill. He lifts a finger up in the air and swirls it around, creating a galactic donut as he throws it at Cell, constraining the android. And with Cell tied up, they begin charging an attack, firing a massive beam that seemingly erases all of Cell. And just like that, Cell seems to be defeated. And the group's pretty elated, with Gotenks even defusing eventually. The group is about to head back, but before they do, the wind suddenly picks up around the area, and they sense that same key from before. No, it can't be. They look back at the crater where Cell was eliminated, and from a single Cell, he regenerates. Stronger than before, even. And he's angered. He wastes no time. Immediately, he launches an attack at Trunks, but before it hits Trunks, Vegeta then jumps in front of it, blocking it, knocking it away, and then going to fight Cell. He tries to buy the group some time so Goten and Trunks can fuse once more, but then they say that they can't fuse. They have a bit of a cooldown period. They gotta wait another 30 minutes or so. They can't do fusion over and over again. Oh crap, this might be an issue. Vegeta is then defeated by Cell, tossed to the side and injured. And since Goku is his main target, Cell jumps right towards him next, with Goku and Chi-Chi taking on the android, as Goten and Trunks join in trying to help. But after taking all that damage from Gotenks, Cell did get stronger thanks to his Saiyan power. And even with all these people fighting him at once, it's still tough. Angered, Gohan then jumps in. He remembers his fight against Frieza. He was helpless before, and died while his parents tried to defeat Frieza. Now, he's gonna reverse the roles. He'll be the one to claim victory here. He's not gonna be that weak fighter that he was before. He punches Cell right in the face. And Cell's surprised to see the child fighting once again. But Gohan shouts as he powers up, with a red aura surrounding him. Wait, what's this? Cell didn't see this power before. But Piccolo immediately recognizes what it is. Gohan's using Kaioken on top of Super Saiyan. How did he manage this? This is a culmination of his training with Kaioken and Super Saiyan, as well as some pure determination on Gohan's part. This is very draining, but very powerful. It's a risky maneuver with a high payoff. His power is insane. He's even stronger than anyone else there. The fight would have been way easier with Gotenks here, but with Gohan and Super Kaioken, they may be able to win this. Gohan doesn't hesitate. With how draining this power is, he wants to end it quick. His attacks overwhelm Cell, doing some immense damage. He fires a massive attack that badly injures Cell, leaving the android to regenerate. Gohan then powers down and lifts his hands up in the air, asking everyone to grant him energy. No one knows what this is, but they decide to do it anyways. Cell tries regenerating, and as he does, he sees a giant blue sphere of energy appear above Gohan's head. And it's growing by the second. Just as soon as he finishes regenerating, the attack is then launched at him. Gohan just created the spear bomb thanks to the help from all his friends. And his family. He used two things they learned from King Kai. Kaioken and the spear bomb. They should erase every single bit of his cell, leaving nothing left. Cell tries to push the spirit bomb back, but as he does, Gohan jumps into Super Kaioken once more, launching a massive blast that not only pushes the spirit bomb towards Cell, but helps to injure the android. And with this, every little bit of Cell is erased, finally eliminating him for good. He powers down exhausted, but victorious. Glad to have taken the victory. The time travelers can now return to their timeline, thanking everyone for their help and hoping everything goes okay here. It was especially nice for them to see Gohan again, as well as all the other people that died that they didn't know too well. And now they could finally save their timeline. With a pretty simple trump card, Gotenks fights the two androids. They're not sure who this fighter is, and they don't have any time to learn, because Gotenks kills them right off the bat. To be honest, if they fought individually, they still would have defeated the androids even if it was one of them alone fighting them. I mean, Trunks was able to do this in the main story. But they did want to try Gotenks just for fun, and they do the same against Future Cell. Following the Cell Saga, Gohan realizes the power of Kaioken. He's dabbled with it a bit before, but this is different. His experience fighting Cell with it, it was a really different one. It gives him a brand new perspective on the form that he didn't even realize. Super Kaioken is pretty draining, but if he tries to practice it with it more, he could potentially create a really strong technique for himself, one that's really only exclusive to him. Well, at least at the moment. Vegeta also is trying to use Kaioken after seeing Gohan use it. Vegeta consults with Piccolo and Gohan to see if they could teach him some more about it. They are the two with the best grasp on it, after all. And maybe, if he learns it for himself, he could be the strongest Saiyan here. He'll have his own Super Kaioken. Yes, that's perfect. Speaking of Piccolo, he also starts training with Kaioken more and more. He's had it for a while, but hasn't really touched it too much. But when you think about it, Kaioken works really well for him. Kaioken will literally tear your body apart if you use it too much. But you know who that won't be a problem for? A Namekian. Someone that can easily regenerate. Piccolo will be able to use this to his advantage. And with his Namekian physiology, he'll actually be able to counter the negative downsides of Kaioken. Sure, it's not like he could use it infinitely, but still, it's better than what Gohan or even Vegeta would have when they try to use it. 
This actually allows Piccolo to keep up with the group, instead of falling behind like most of the other fighters do in Dragon Ball. Kaioken will keep Piccolo relevant in this scenario, especially going forward as he practices more and more with it, getting it to higher and higher levels that no one even knew was possible, especially King Kai. He and Gohan continue this training with Kaioken, with Vegeta trying to tag long time to time to learn it more for himself. Eventually this leads to Vegeta getting Super Kaioken over the 7 year time skip, and he quickly learns that it was kind of a mistake. Well, not entirely. It is really powerful, but when he uses it, he instantly feels drained. He's gonna have to practice with it a lot more. It's not like surpassing Super Saiyan like Goku and Chi-Chi are trying to do. After the Cell Saga, they realize that it might be best to try and surpass Super Saiyan if they can. There's probably a level beyond what they have now, a way to get even stronger with the same form. A potential Super Saiyan 2, maybe. They're not entirely sure, but they're gonna train for it. Worst case scenario, they get stronger and don't get a new form, which is still a plus. But if their theory is right, they could potentially get a lot stronger than before. And while we're kinda on the topic of Vegeta, let's talk about his grudge for a bit. He still does hold that grudge towards Chi Chi. Obviously, he suppressed it by now and kinda gotten over it, but it's still there a little bit. He can't help but think first of all, why was that a secret for so long? Why did they never tell him about that? And second of all, why did Chi Chi even do that in the first place? Why wish to be a Saiyan? Well, he knows why. Being a Saiyan would make her way stronger than being a human, think about it. But he also views it as being cheap and kind of disrespectful in a way. Obviously he can't articulate why, but he just feels that. He obviously keeps this to himself though, not really mentioning it over the 7 years or bringing it up at all. But once those 7 years are over, we get to the world tournament. And wouldn't you know it, Goku's actually alive this time. I mean regardless, he was going to participate. As for the roster, well, we don't really need to cover it. Really the only change is that instead of 18, there's Chi Chi. And to be fair, the tournament isn't really the highlight of this arc, that would obviously be the Buu Saga. The tournament starts out pretty normal. There is not really much that would change here even with Chi Chi being a Saiyan, so everything up to Gohan's energy getting stolen will pretty much be the same. The group flies over with Shin and Kibito, trying to find where Bobbidi and its people are stationed. Deborah notices everyone arriving, and this is both good and bad. Good because they have a lot of potential people to get energy from here. Bad because, well, there's too many people. It's nice to have all this energy, but if they stop you from getting that energy, it's not really worthwhile. Before he makes a move, he's gonna have to think of a really smart plan for this. He needs something that'll allow him to get the edge. He has one opportunity for a sneak attack. Instead of going to kill Kibito, he has a better idea. He jumps up and spits at random, hitting Goku and Vegeta. Before they even realize it, the two Saiyans are turned into stone, and that only leaves Piccolo, Chi Chi, and Gohan to fight. And Krillin, I guess, but he doesn't want to do anything. But he is there, which that counts for something. Deborah then flies up to the ship, with the three other fighters chasing after him, as well as Shin and Kibito, unsure of what to do next. And obviously, the first two fighters in the ship aren't too hard to fight. Pui Pui and Yakon, they're no big deal. Deborah is the main course. But the group's not going to fight him one on one. If they really want to make this quick and preserve energy, they're going to have to fight him all together. But still, they gotta make sure not to go overboard, otherwise Bobbidi will get his energy. But with the three of them, they may be able to overpower him and kill him. Actually, as soon as they start fighting, they realize that even Gohan alone might be able to handle this. Deborah is comparable to Cell after all, and who killed Cell? Gohan tells him to stand back as he goes into Super Kyle camp. Deborah realizes that Gohan's gonna overpower him, but in order for their plan to work, they need Deborah alive. They need to keep at least one of the people turned into stone. Deborah powers up and gets ready to fight back, but also makes a surprising maneuver. He retreats. He wants this to be a distraction. Only Gohan ends up following him just like he wanted. Piccolo and Chi Chi stay back with Shin and Kibito. But as Deborah flies away, Babidi asks him to do something. Release one of the people from the stone, the one with the really spiky hair. Wait, they both have spiky hair. Okay, well, release the shorter one. Oh, that guy, yeah. Deborah releases Vegeta from the stone. Wondering why Babidi would want to do that, but he trusts his plan. Babidi actually has a really good idea in mind. Sure, it would be great to have two of them stay as stone, but what would be even better is have one of them turn into his servants. Vegeta actually seems like he might be able to be possessed. And imagine if he had that kind of power on his side instead of it just being there doing nothing. Bobbidi begins looking into Vegeta's mind, trying to figure out if there's anything he can exploit. Oh, it seems like he has a lot of pent up anger. There's so much in Vegeta's mind that makes him, well, Vegeta. Not just him wanting to go back to the way he was, but also his grudge against Kakarot and Chi Chi. Vegeta actually gives him to Bobbidi like he does normally, creating Majin Vegeta. No one knows what's happening so far because they're still inside the ship, but suddenly Vegeta enters. He's in Super Saiyan and he looks a bit different. He has an M on his forehead and he looks like he's wearing eyeshadow or something. Why does Vegeta have makeup on? But Shin realizes what happened. He's been possessed by Bobbidi. And Vegeta has one main target right in front of him, Chi Chi. Piccolo is willing to help her fight, but she says that she needs to handle this on her own. Shin agrees. If Piccolo joins the fight, that just gives more energy to Bobbidi. So now the entire group is spread out. 
it's Piccolo with Shin and Kibito, Chi Chi fighting Majin Vegeta, and Gohan fighting Dabura. Shin hopes that they can defeat Dabura and Majin Vegeta, because otherwise Babidi will definitely get his energy. Going over to Dabura for a bit, he's just trying to bide for time. He knows that if Gohan catches up, he'll win. If that happens, that'll release Goku from the stone, meaning that their group wins. It's all hinging on Dabura being alive. Using his own magical abilities and strength, he's trying to hold Gohan off in any way possible, manipulating the landscape around him to try to slow him down, keeping himself hidden, stuff like that. As for Chi-Chi and Vegeta, their fight begins. She wonders why he actually let himself be possessed. Shin assumed that was the case, and she believes it too. What made him do this? Vegeta says it's not important. He's focused on the fight. He's going to beat her once and for all, proving his superiority as a Saiyan, showing he's stronger than both her and Goku. It's time to finally settle this with an all-out battle. Vegeta powers up, showing a brand new technique of his. A red aura appears around him, as his power soars. Just like Gohan, he now has access to Super Kaioken, and this actually makes him a really formidable opponent. But luckily, Chi-Chi also has something up her sleeve, something that she was hiding. She also powers up, sparks of electricity surround her. Her energy soars, and her hair gets even spikier than it was before. Chi-Chi introduces Vegeta to Super Saiyan 2. Wait, there's a way to go beyond Super Saiyan? He doesn't care though. Super Kaioken is much stronger, and even though it's draining, he has the advantage. And their fight begins. Immediately, Chi-Chi knows she's outmatched. But for a certain reason, she doesn't back down. She knows there actually might be a way out of this. As long as she lets Vegeta keep fighting, he'll run out of energy. He's relying too much on Super Kaioken. Of course, she knows the draining effects of it. Gohan's her kid, after all. And she knows if she lets Vegeta draw it out, he'll end up injuring himself too much and losing too much energy, which will then give Chi-Chi the advantage. Just like Debora, she's biding for time right now. As Gohan chases Debora, Debora then ends up running into someone. It's Shin, Kibito, and Piccolo. Shin teleported all of them to that area, deciding that it might be best to get involved. Even though it might give more energy to Babidi, it's their best chance of stopping this quickly. This catches Debora off guard and gives Gohan a chance to attack. And with a single blast, he erases Debora, killing him instantly. Now they need to get to where Chi Chi is. And as they try and come up with a plan, they sense another energy approaching rapidly. Actually, it's not coming towards them, it's going to where Chi Chi and Vegeta are. They know what energy it is now. It's Goku. After killing Debora, he's been freed from the stone, and he's heading over to help Chi-Chi as quickly as possible. Vegeta's surprised by a kick to the back of the head, turning around as he sees Goku standing there in Super Saiyan. Goku looks over to Chi-Chi. Oh, she's already using Super Saiyan 2. There's no point in him hiding it either, and instantly he powers up into his own Super Saiyan 2. This only serves to piss Vegeta off more and more. Goku's not interested in talking right now. He and Chi-Chi need to end this fight as quickly as possible. That's the priority. Vegeta powers up more and more, pushing Kaioken to his limits, Right now he's in times 4, but he goes up to times 10, feeling pained as he does so, and Goku and Chi-Chi notice this. This is their shot at victory. The two team up and fight Vegeta, and quickly they're able to dismantle his defenses. Vegeta's strength is fleeting, and instead of getting stronger, he's getting weaker and weaker, allowing the two of them to land a final attack, knocking Vegeta unconscious, and as they do so, Shin teleports over with his group. Glad to see the result. Good, they are able to stop both Debora and Vegeta. Shin can work his magic and try and actually fix Vegeta, trying to get rid of that possession. So they can reverse everything, all they need to do now is handle Baba. Things may actually be going their way. Although they're feeling optimistic, Shin then senses something terrifying. No, they were too late. The rest of the group begins sensing it as well. An overwhelming evil presence is nearby, alongside Babidi's presence. They rush back over to the ship, expecting the worst case scenario, and they find exactly that. The ship is completely gone. It's just a massive crater in the ground. Babidi is standing there with a smile, greeting everyone. Piccolo launches a quick blast at him, but Babidi immediately throws up a shield. Even if Piccolo did succeed at killing Babidi, that wouldn't even matter. He just chuckles at this. He wants to introduce everyone to his new friend, Majin Buu. That's right, they gave just enough energy to revive him, and now, the terrifying Majin is there, under Babidi's control ready to fight everyone. The group doesn't really know how to react, except Goku. He immediately goes into a fighting stance, ready to battle, powering up into Super Saiyan 2 holding nothing back, and he tells the group, there's no point in suppressing your power now. Now's their chance to show off the fruits of their training. Alongside Goku, Chi Chi powers up into Super Saiyan 2. Gohan's in Super Saiyan, but he stacks Kaioken on top of it. He's reached a point where he could use Kaioken times 2 with relatively little strength, basically equaling Super Saiyan 2 in power. And if he needs, he can increase his power output, although it will be draining. And as for Piccolo, he's practiced with Kaioken so much that he can use it at really high levels, with relatively little strain as well. It's basically his own version of Super Saiyan, powering up into Kaioken times 50, a huge feat that'll really help in the battle. And surprisingly, although he's shaking in fear, even Krillin joins him. And together, the group lunges at Majin Buu. Right now, they're just ready to gauge his power. They might actually be able to defeat him, 
although it doesn't seem too likely. But that doesn't matter though. In the worst case scenario, they do have one thing to rely on, fusion. Although some people didn't learn it from Piccolo yet, they could always find a way to buy it for time and get to the time chamber to learn it. But they might not even need it. Right now they'll just use this, their strength, combined with their perfect teamwork. They come to learn that Boo actually regenerates, and it's nothing like Cells either. He could do it without any downsides at all, infinitely regenerating and never losing energy. He seems almost unstoppable, but if they power up just to a certain point, they'll be able to defeat him, erasing every little bit of him before he could regenerate. Boo lifts his hands up, performing a massive explosion attack, knocking everyone far away. He grins as he goes towards them. He actually seems like he's having fun, and he's starting to get serious himself. Boo splits himself up into multiple copies, with one to fight each of the fighters. Although they're not as strong as the main Boo, but this helps him to stop being outnumbered. Shin and Kabito are there watching, wondering what their next move should be. If they can't defeat Boo, then what are they supposed to do? The group is strong together, but as they watch the battle, they're beginning to realize something. They're also pretty worn out from their own battles. Goku and Piccolo are really the only ones that are uninjured. Chi Chi had her fight with Vegeta, Gohan had his fight with Deborah, and as for Vegeta, he still needs to be restored back to normal, and obviously needs to regain consciousness before he could help. But Shin's not sure if they could even trust him at the moment, and as the group continues fighting, they only lose more and more stamina, while Boo keeps on going at full power. This might actually be an issue. The fight with Majin Boo continues. He's relentless. No matter what they do, it seems nothing's working. They can't just hurt him, he regenerates. It's not like they could tire him out either. He just keeps going, it seems like he's not losing any stamina at all. And the worst part is, he's having fun with all this. This is enjoyable for him. And not only that, he's trying to turn them into candy too so they have to avoid his magic as well as his attacks. The group tries everything. They try fighting individually. They try fighting together. They try doing new strategies that they've never done before. Even with Goku and Chi Chi there in Super Saiyan 2, there's nothing much that they can do. Every idea that someone in the group offers doesn't help. Shin and Kibito are getting more and more anxious. They really want to retreat by now, telling the group that it might be their best option. But they insist on doing this. Not to mention, if they retreat, that means they're gonna leave Boo here to wreak havoc on Earth. They gotta at least find a way to slow him down, if anything. They're not entirely sure they can defeat him, but maybe they could stall him for a bit. At least until they actually do think of something. Just to have some more fun, Boo begins launching candy beams everywhere. Not even necessarily trying to be precise, he's just shooting them around. This poses some trouble for the group because if they turn into candy, I don't think I need to tell you that that's a bad thing. This is probably worse than his regular attacks because if they're hit by that, they're completely incapacitated. They narrowly avoid these attacks, while Piccolo begins talking to Gohan. Maybe the two of them need to try and max out Kaioken even more. Yeah, it's risky, but if they go to higher levels, it'll be more effective. And even though they could only use it for a short period of time, it'll be just enough. Just a short burst of more energy might be what they need to actually defeat Boo. But Gohan tells Piccolo that's impossible. He doesn't have enough energy left to go beyond where he is right now. Not only will it deplete too fast and injure him too much, but it's just not possible at the moment. He doesn't have the energy in him to spit. If they give him some time to charge more energy, maybe he'll be able to do it. But it's still not definite, although it seems like their best chance right now. And in order to do that, the group would need to hold off Boo for much longer, which also seems kind of impossible at the moment. There has to be some good plan that they could do to at least hold Boo off. Goku and Chi Chi turn to each other and get an idea. If Gohan needs more energy, they'll be glad to lend it. Gohan asks why they're doing that. If they give up their energy, then they're not going to be able to do anything. But they remind Gohan of the trade-off. Super Saiyan 2 is not something that they can keep increasing. But as for Kaioken, Gohan doesn't know his limits with that. Maybe if they gave him some of their energy and charged him up more, that burst of Kaioken that he does could be higher than anyone's power at the moment. Even if it'll only be for a brief few seconds, that brief few seconds might be enough for him to charge up at full power Kamehameha, launching it at Boo and incinerating it. It's a very risky maneuver, but really, they don't really have anything else to do at the moment. So, they decide to go with this. Boo watches on confused as Goku and Chi Chi put their hand on Gohan, powering up into Super Saiyan 2, and then going down into base as Gohan's filled with their energy. And Gohan feels completely recharged. Not only is he at his maximum output, but he has a little extra that he could use. It's a huge boost in energy and a huge boost in power, and it makes him feel more confident in their plan. Without wasting any time, he immediately goes into Kaioken once more, but this time it's different. He's powering up way beyond where he ever was before. Piccolo watches on amazed. Gohan's not only in Super Saiyan, but he has Kaioken on top of that at a pretty high level. He shouts times 10. This is their only shot at defeating Boo right now. Just consider how strong that is in comparison to everyone else. It's the multiplier of Super Saiyan with another 10 times multiplier on top of it. It's massive. Although it's not really something he'd use them all, it's not like he has infinite energy to do this. And it also is pretty painful. Gohan quickly lunges at Boo and begins attacking, and he's actually overwhelming the Majin. He's trying his hardest to find an opening so he can launch a full power attack to erase him. And the group watches on hoping everything goes okay, but then they hear Shin behind them yell out. He notices that something's wrong. Not with Boo or Gohan, but Vegeta. He's gone. 
He was just unconscious on the ground nearby, and now they can't find him. As Gohan continues Boo, he's then shocked that someone else jumps into fight too. A quick flash of red light appears, and then Gohan sees Vegeta. He's woken up, and it seems he's overcome the Majin curse. The group looks over to see him as well. Vegeta actually seems like he's back to normal, and he tells the group to stop messing around. Gohan's power up might be great, but he can't do this alone. He offers Gohan his help, and the two begin fighting together. Krillin and Piccolo watch on as well. And since Krillin's really the only one who hasn't lost all his power, he lends it to Piccolo, telling him to join the fight. Piccolo didn't expect this, but he thanks Krillin. The power from Krillin isn't a huge amount, but it's just enough for him to get back into the battle. Vegeta, Gohan, and Piccolo are teamed up against Boo, all of them in Kaioken. Vegeta tells them right away, they need to coordinate. They need to synchronize the perfect attack to defeat Boo. And he tells them to get ready on his command. When they get the cue, he wants them to all power up with Kaioken, going to the maximum output they have possible. He doesn't care if it hurts them or uses all their energy. It's their last chance. The other fighters decide to help with the distraction. Even though Goku, Chi-Chi, and Krillin don't have much power left, Chi-Chi and Krillin each create a Kienzan, flinging it at Boo as he sliced into pieces. Goku then jumps in, blinding Boo, creating the perfect opening. Vegeta shouts now. And together, the three of them all power up. A massive red aura appears. And the entire area begins shaking as they shout Kaioken. The light from it is so bright too. Even from the tournament arena, people notice a red glow from far away. As the three prepare their Kaioken assault. Boo regenerates from being attacked by Chi-Chi and Krillin. But just as he does, he's hit head on by three beam attacks. This attack is so powerful that it incinerates the entire area turning all of the sand around them into glass. The clouds part above as the beams launch off into the atmosphere, with Boo desperately trying to push back, but to no avail, as he's destroyed by their combined attacks. Bobbity is defeated, Boo's defeated, and now it seems that they claim victory. Goku, Chi-Chi, Krillin, and the two Kais watch on amaze, and they see Boo's completely eradicated. And obviously Bobbity stands no chance. Gohan and Vegeta power down exhausted, collapsing onto the ground, with Piccolo barely being able to stand. He could at least handle Kyle Ken better. But Vegeta and Gohan can't even stand up. They did it. They defeated Boo. And the best part is, Vegeta seems to be back to normal. He apologizes to the group for his actions, and hopes that this makes up for it. So with all this out of the way, the Boo saga has ended. And now we can move on to the next arc. So naturally, there's another short time skip in between everything. And everyone continues training. Goku and Chichi continue down their current path, wondering if they could surpass Super Saiyan 2. Goten even joins in on their training as well. He is older now, and due to him being a full Saiyan, he's not the same Goten. Not that he was never motivated in the original series, but here, he's so much more focused on wanting to actually fight. And even though he doesn't have the immense potential of a hybrid Saiyan, he makes up for it with all his great training and his training partners. He wants to one day become just as strong as his brother and his parents. And he definitely has that Saiyan mindset. It's weird, he's really the first of his kind. A pure Saiyan born on Earth and being raised there. And unlike Goku, it's not like he has to hit his head to become good. He's just raised to be good. As for Vegeta, he's kind of in a weird spot. He doesn't really have a rivalry with Goku like he has in the main series, nor does he have one with Chi-Chi, but is instead really focused on himself. Although it's kind of dissipated, he still does feel that Chi-Chi cheated, but he doesn't care that much about it anymore, and thinks that there's no point competing. If anything, it just serves as more motivation to him. Unlike Chi-Chi, he won't have to rely on tricks or wishes to get strong. Pure training will be enough. He's somewhat distant from Goku compared to normal. Obviously, the two see each other from time to time and train, but he's not too set on that. Oddly enough, he actually forms more of a rivalry with Piccolo, and with Gohan too. Considering the three of them use a similar technique, the three of them like to train together, since it's really something that only the three of them can really relate on. Not to mention, since they are practicing Kaioken, they decide to visit King Kai from time to time. He does know most about it after all. And while Goku and Chi Chi are set on improving Super Saiyan 2, these three are more set on improving Kaioken. Unlike those Saiyan transformations, Kaioken might not have limits, besides the strength of one's body. But in terms of the multipliers, they could probably keep going even higher and higher. Piccolo's already got it at great rates, he can go up to times 100. For Gohan and Vegeta, it's obviously different, but maybe they can go even beyond that too. And who knows what Piccolo could strive for? Times 200? Times 500? 1000? They're excited just thinking about it, and they know they want to surpass their limits in this way. Vegeta and Gohan view this as better than Super Saiyan 2, because if they perfect Kaioken to a certain level, it'll be a bigger multiplier. They saw what it was like for Gohan when he got that power up during the Buu Saga, and Super Saiyan 2 would just mean they have to relearn Super Kaioken again. It wouldn't really be worth the effort. As for Piccolo, his best course of action is to strengthen his regeneration, instead of trying to increase Kaioken at the moment. He does get more efficient with Kaioken, but more importantly, getting more efficient with regeneration first would be better. If he becomes more efficient with that, he will regenerate quicker with less stamina usage, and that'll help with Kaioken to the point where it could be used for prolonged periods of time and with higher multipliers. Once his regeneration is improved far beyond where it is now, he'll then start focusing on higher multiplications of Kaioken. Combine the two together, and you get a really powerful combo for Piccolo. 
making him a very formidable arrival for Vegeta and Gohan. Everyone's life continues normally for a few years, but one day while these three are on King Kai's planet, King Kai starts panicking. Apparently some sort of visitor is coming. And King Kai tries to play it off like it's all okay, but eventually lets it slip that it's Lord Beerus, and Vegeta hears this name and is shocked. King Kai's surprised. Wait, Vegeta knows who Beerus is? Oh no, this can't be good. Beerus then arrives on the planet, amused to see that King Kai has three students. Vegeta immediately bows, and Gohan and Piccolo don't really know what to do, so they just bow in response as well. He introduces himself to Gohan and Piccolo, and as for Vegeta, he tells Vegeta what he's here for. He's looking for something called a Super Saiyan God, and since Vegeta is a Saiyan after all, maybe he knows something about it. Vegeta's actually kind of confused by this. He's never heard of a Super Saiyan God, but if Beerus wants, they could fight him, just so he can get a gauge of their power. Well, if they say so. Vegeta fights Beerus first, it goes nowhere. Gohan then fights Beerus, and that goes nowhere. And just for fun, even though he's not a Saiyan, Piccolo fights too, but that goes nowhere. Although, Beerus is impressed with their strength. This Kaioken thing that they're using is pretty impressive, and he commends King Kai for it. It seems he's taught his students well. Although, there still is the issue that they've never found out about any Super Saiyan God or whatever. He still does want to look for it. Although he is kind of enjoying himself here, he tells all three of them to fight him at once. That might be more interesting, and with the three of them fighting together, he's surprised at their teamwork and their power combined. It does make the fight more interesting, but of course Beerus would still win. He fends them all off, but sees their promise. So, there really is no Super Saiyan God though. Vegeta tells Beerus that there are more Saiyans on Earth, but they wouldn't know about anything either. There's two full Saiyan adults and a full Saiyan kid. But Vegeta says if anything, he'd be the one to know about this. And they're more focused on some Super Saiyan 3 thing or whatever. Beerus turns to Whis and the two of them begin thinking. Why not invite Vegeta to their planet? From what they're hearing and seeing, he seems to be the strongest. And since it's called Super Saiyan God, it might have something to do with God Ki. Whis theorizes that maybe, if Vegeta gets access to God Ki, he could then get Super Saiyan God just from training, assuming it is some sort of transformation. As the name implies, it's a Super Saiyan form, two of which are already pre-existing and are able to be unlocked. Well, Vegeta concurs with this. He can't really think of anything else, so he'll go with them if they want. It'll also be better training for him. Gohan and Piccolo decide to stay with King Kai since he's closer to Earth, while Vegeta ends up going with Beerus. And Beerus tells Vegeta, if this goes well, he'll grab those other two Saiyans on Earth. Three chances at a Super Saiyan God. That'll make the odds much better than they are right now. Eventually, Goku and Chi Chi do hear about this. If they're not too shocked about Beerus being a thing, they're more so shocked that Vegeta went off and trained on his own without them. Whatever sort of godly training he's doing sounds really interesting, and they wish they got to go. And as I mentioned, they would eventually get invited, although there is one issue. Chi Chi and Goku are concerned about Goten. He would be left on Earth pretty much alone. Of course, Gohan would be there and he could help take care of Goten, but still, he'd be without his parents. But surprisingly, Goten's actually kind of fine with this. It may seem weird, but you gotta remember, Goten's a full Saiyan. Full Saiyans are much more individualistic. I mean, look at Vegeta and Raditz. They were around destroying planets as kids. Baby Saiyans are sent to low-level planets to destroy them, and they mature surprisingly quick. Even Goku as a kid, while he definitely wasn't a normal Saiyan at that point, he was still very independent living out in the woods alone. Plus, Goten thinks he's fine because he has a bunch of other people there. Gohan and Videl are there after all if he needs anything, as well as Bulma. He's a lot more mature and self-sufficient than a regular human at his age. He can live fine alone, and Vegeta actually notes this too. It does make sense for a full Saiyan to act like this. Well, if Goten says so, if he ever needs anything, they'll definitely come back here. But he insists that he's fine on his own, and if anything, this will be better for him. Training alone might be better than what he's doing right now. It'll make him less reliant on others. So, the two of them go off to Beerus' planet with Vegeta. And not long after doing so, Goten immediately regrets saying this. Not because he misses them or doesn't feel like he could live alone, but because he feels bored. He feels like he's left behind in a way. If anything, he should have just gone with them. Beerus didn't really want some kid running around his planet, which Goten's kind of bummed out about. But even besides that, he feels like it's a symptom of a larger issue. He asks Trunks if he feels the same, but Trunks doesn't really mind. He likes training now and then, but his human side makes him much more accustomed to living peacefully, and not so focused on trying to get stronger and being able to blow up planets or whatever. But Goten feels that they're wasting their potential. They could be doing so much more in terms of power. It would be nice if they were involved in all of these cool fights with their parents and Gohan. They continue their training while on Earth, keeping this in mind. They want to get involved in whatever big fight is next. They want to prove that they're responsible enough to do this thing. Maybe if they do that, Goten can get a ticket onto Beerus' planet, training at the high level that everyone else is training at. Gohan takes Goten to King Kai's planet sometimes, and while he has fun with that, he doesn't really want to focus on learning Kaioken like Gohan is. Learning Kaioken at the level that Piccolo and Gohan have it at, that's going to take him way too long. And plus, it's not like he can stay on King Kai's planet for too long. He goes back and forth from there and Earth to get to school and everything. He really just wants to get involved in the fight, and he's pretty bummed out. One day, he's training with Trunks, and they notice something odd up in the sky. 
there's spaceships approaching Earth. They're definitely not made by humans. They're not sure what it is, but it's definitely some sort of alien spaceship. And Goten realizes, this is his chance. This must be some sort of alien invasion. He can defend Earth against him and prove himself as strong. Trunks is ready to join in too. And the two head out to where that spaceship is going towards. So just like I said in the last part, everyone's pretty much off on their own training. Gohan and Piccolo are mostly with King Kai, although they do visit Earth occasionally. As for Goku, Chi Chi, and Vegeta, they're all on Beerus' planet, training to get the next level of Super Saiyan God. And without any of them there, the strongest line of defense is Goten and Trunks. At the end of the last part, Goten and Trunks noticed a spaceship approaching. They weren't too sure what it is, but they decided it's best to go see what's happening. Just as soon as they see it, the two of them chase it down. Goten expects a fight's about to brew. Maybe he'll finally get to show his strength. Maybe he'll finally get to prove himself. Trunks says that it might be friendly aliens. Who knows? But as they get closer to the ship, they start to doubt that. It looks very menacing. This isn't something that normal aliens would arrive on. This is definitely some sort of malicious attempt at an invasion. Soldiers start pouring out of the ship, as other ships arrive for backup. Just as quickly as Goten and Trunks got there, other fighters start arriving. Krillin, Tenshinhan, Roshi, even Yamcha and Chiaotzu. They know that the other strong fighters are gone from Earth, so if this is actually a threat, they're gonna need as much help as possible. At first, no one knows what this is, but Krillin then recognizes the ship and then a person that steps off it. It's Frieza! Krillin's absolutely terrified, as well as everyone else. Goten and Trunks aren't too sure what's going on, but Krillin begins explaining. Although there's no need for an explanation, Frieza introduces himself and tells everyone how he's alive once more. And not only that, but he's stronger than before. He's been training. A lot. Well, a lot in Frieza terms. Not really much in comparison to all the people on Earth. But for Frieza, even this short training is good enough. First, he'll give everyone an appetizer, as he sends his forces to go attack them. Even without Gohan and Piccolo here, it's pretty easy to defend against all these fighters. But as the group is fighting Frieza's army, Frieza looks on and notices something weird. One of the fighters there. He's wearing an orange outfit. He has a tail, and his hairstyle. It's unmistakable. He looks just like Goku. This only serves to anger Frieza more and more. That must be Goku's breath. He knows Goku had one, but he didn't know there was another now. The thing that pisses him off most is how much he looks like Goku. But surprisingly, he doesn't see Goku. He doesn't see Chi-Chi or Vegeta either. This might actually be good. It's just those two kids and some random Earthlings. He would prefer if they were here, but he could also wreak havoc on Earth and leave them present, then going to visit them later on. The army is defeated pretty easily, as Frieza then walks up to the group. Immediately they're on guard, and Goten jumps into Super Saiyan. This stuns Frieza for a bit. He wasn't expecting another Super Saiyan, much less a kid. Goten takes this opportunity to begin attacking Frieza. He catches the Emperor off guard and begins attacking, no hesitation at all. He's actually dealing some considerable damage to Frieza. He's only in his first form right now. Even better, Trunks then decides to join in and help Goten, also turning Super Saiyan. There's two more Super Saiyans, and they're kids? As Frieza's getting overwhelmed by the two fighters, his concern washes away, turning into pure anger. Whether it's Goku, Chi Chi, or their spawn, he doesn't care. He's come here for blood, and he's gonna get it. He launches a blast that knocks the two fighters back. It doesn't injure them at all, but it gives Frieza some room to breathe. Now he'll stop playing around. He transforms, going into his final form. This isn't his full power, but he expects that this will be enough for these two brats. Super Saiyan or not, his training has been fruitful, and this power alone is more than that of a Super Saiyan. Even with Frieza transforming, Goten's undeterred. Krillin tells him to be careful, but Goten says it's fine. He's stronger on his own now too. He doesn't want anyone underestimating him, and he's not going to give up here. He starts attacking Frieza once more, and Trunks joins in too to help. And even with Frieza transformed, the two of them together actually are doing some damage. Although instead of overwhelming Frieza now, they're mostly just holding him off. It's a very even fight between the three of them. Frieza is actually somewhat impressed. It's not enough to overpower him, but enough to make this fight annoying. Maybe he should really show off his true power. He said before that he wasn't playing around, but still, it seems like he didn't get serious enough. Ah well. He needed to test out his new power anyways. This will be the perfect opportunity. He got to slaughter two Saiyans. And not just any two Saiyans, but they're the kids of Saiyans that he hates. This fight ends here. He begins powering up, and a golden glow fills the area. Everyone watches on terrified. Even Trunks is scared too. Goten's concerned, but he tries not to show it. He needs to act strong here. He needs to defend Earth. It's his responsibility. It's a chance to grow stronger, and it's a chance to prove himself to everyone. Frieza reveals his new golden form. And once more, the young Saiyan and the young hybrid Saiyan launch towards him. But this time, even in Super Saiyan, their combined might isn't enough. Frieza keeps dodging their attacks, even blocking them and attacking back. They do hit him occasionally, but they don't do any damage to him. He's so much stronger now in this form. Frieza's actually getting a kick out of this. Now they see. They see his true power, the splendor of the Emperor. Goten then powers up once more, going into Super Saiyan 2 now angry. And Frieza feels like he was mocked before. 
Goten was holding back this whole time. He wasn't using his true power. But even so, this gives Frieza more enjoyment. Even at their full power, they're hopeless against him. Nothing that they do could stop him. They fight harder and harder, and the humans even try helping, but they don't do much. Goten's just getting angry. Not really at Frieza, but more so angry at himself. It's like I mentioned last time and have been saying throughout this part. Goten's been kind of doubting himself a bit. He feels that as a Saiyan, he's not doing as much as he could. And yeah, he knows he's young. He knows that's something that'll limit his power, but still, he feels useless in a way. Even at his full strength, he can't even hope to defend Earth. He did put up a fight, but it wasn't enough. He needs more power. He wants to help. Frieza then launches an attack at Trunks. And as the weaker of the two, Trunks is hopeless to defend against it. Goten makes a split second decision, powering up further, then flying over to where Trunks is, trying to block the attack. He knocks his friend out of the way, and quickly tries to push back the attack, but only barely manages to do so. The attack then blows up in front of him, knocking him far away, injuring him and rendering him unconscious. He lies there on the ground, disappointed in himself. They're completely outmatched. He can't do anything. He failed at defending Earth. Trunks stands up and watches as Frieza gets closer and closer to him, laughing as he sees Goten on the ground. Well, that's one monkey down. One more to go, and then he'll slaughter everyone else here. He menacingly gets closer and closer to the group, with Trunks in front of them, as they all cower in fear. But two voices then shout out, and out of nowhere, Frieza's chest explodes. Two beams of energy burst out of it, swirling in unison. Frieza drops to the ground, and behind him the group sees a red glow that dissipates, revealing Piccolo and Gohan. With a combined Makanko Sapo, they caught Frieza off guard and knocked him down. A double Makanko Sapo, if you will. They make sure all the other fighters are alright, and Trunks points over to Goten. He's injured, but at least he's okay. He's just unconscious right now. Seeing this only serves to anger Gohan more and more. Not only is it bad enough that Frieza's here, but he hurt his brother, and it seems he hurt him back. He turns over to where Frieza's lying on the ground. He's almost dead, but barely still alive. Weakly on the ground, he props himself up with one arm, and begins chuckling. No matter what these monkeys do, he won't be stopped. Look how pathetic everyone here is, cowering out of fear. And the only one that hoped to serve a chance is down on the ground. The only way they actually hurt Frieza was by a sneak attack. In his other hand, he begins charging a blast, ready to aim it right towards Earth. But before he could even do so, he's lifted up in the air by Gohan. As Gohan holds Frieza in front of him, he stares down the Emperor, picking on children. Frieza knows no lows. He tells Frieza it was a big mistake not only showing up here, but hurting Goten. But Gohan will make sure he never returns. With a single blast, he completely eradicates Frieza. Finishing the job, finally killing the Emperor for good. The group leaves the area. Gohan and Piccolo take Goten to the lookout. Aiming to get him healed and figure out what happened, Goten recounts all the events, and how he and Trunks briefly held off Frieza until he turned into the Scolden form. Goten still regrets what happened. He feels weak. He couldn't do anything. He had to rely on Gohan and Piccolo to save the day, and if they didn't sense what was happening on Earth, Earth would have been destroyed because Goten's too weak to defend it. Gohan tells him that's not the case. Frieza's a really tough opponent, especially at Goten's age. He's amazed at how strong his brother is and how he was able to even hold Frieza off. And think about it this way, if Goten weren't as strong as he was, well, Earth would have been destroyed right away. Gohan and Piccolo wouldn't have had a chance to save him. And even better, he reminds Goten that he's a Saiyan. Goten got some bad injuries during that fight. And as a Saiyan, he's only getting stronger and stronger as this happens. Goten completely forgot about that too. Not only will this battle serve as a great experience, but it did actually make him stronger in a few ways. And Gohan's right. He shouldn't be so defeatist about everything. Yeah, he might not be as strong as the others, but he's strong enough as is, and he's just gonna get stronger as he keeps training. One day he's gonna stop doubting himself. He'll prove his strength not only to everyone around him, but to himself. Thankfully, that arc ends all well. And next up, we have the Universe 6 Tournament. By this time, Goku, Vegeta, and Chi-Chi are all back on Earth, and they hear what happened with Frieza. They're pretty proud of Goten and Trunks for what they did. And it's good that Gohan and Piccolo were able to arrive in time. But now they face another challenge. They need a team for the tournament. As you could probably guess, they already have three different fighters, Goku, Vegeta, and Chi-Chi. The next natural best picks would be Piccolo and Gohan, but as for Gohan, he decides not to attend. He tells him to recruit Goten instead. He could have a chance at this. I mean, this just sounds like a friendly tournament. It can't be that serious, right? It's not like Earth is going to magically disappear to Universe 6 or anything if they lose, right? Goten's actually glad to hear this and joins the team immediately. Well, Goku and Chi-Chi think this could be a good experience for him. Not only will they get to see his strength firsthand, but it'll be in a more friendly manner instead of him trying to defend Earth desperately against an evil emperor. And it's Goten's lucky day, or maybe unlucky day, because he's actually chosen first for the tournament, meaning he'll be the first fighter in the ring. All right, that's kind of a lot of pressure for him, but he'll make it work. His first opponent is Batamo, and as you'd probably expect, Batamo's not really that strong of a fighter, but it's his abilities that make him impressive. Goten can easily dodge all of his attacks, but none of his attacks work against Batamo. Every time he hits Batamo, he just tanks it, 
taking no damage at all and not even flinching. Goten's gotta think, and he's got the perfect idea. Just hit harder. He wanted to pace himself, but he jumps into Super Saiyan, and then delivers a bunch of full power attacks at Patama. It's still not hurting him, but he notices something. But Tamo's actually moving back when he attacks. The force of his punches are so strong that it kind of flings Batamo back with his elastic body, and he just got another idea. Just as soon as he attacks again, he quickly powers up into Super Saiyan 2, giving his punch more impact as he launches Batamo out of the ring. Next up, he'll be facing Frost. Of course, this kind of angers him a bit. This guy looks just like Frieza, although he's acting like a good guy. Something's really off about him, but it seems like he actually is good, so maybe he's not like Frieza. He shouldn't judge Frost by his cover. I mean, Goten doesn't want to be racist, right? If anything, Frieza would want him to be racist. He's not gonna do that. But as it turns out, maybe he should have been racist, because Frost is actually a pretty bad guy. Goten actually seems to have the upper hand during the battle, but then he gets poisoned by Frost, and they find out and Frost gets disqualified. Although instead of Vegeta jumping in, Goten stays in the ring. After a few minutes, he's fine, and the poison doesn't affect him anymore. And his next opponent is Mageta. This one's gonna be a bit harder. Like, literally. Mageta's body is so incredibly strong that none of Goten's attacks do any damage to him. It would be nice if Whis told him the weakness of the Metal Man, but he's actually interested to see how Goten performs. Goten tries to employ strategies like he did with Patama, trying to just knock him out of the ring instead of focusing on his pure power. But it's impossible. Mageta's just so heavy, and so durable, that nothing works. Eventually, this leads to Goten losing, as Mageta steams him out of the ring. Goten's kind of bummed out about this, but everyone congratulates him for its performance against Patamo and Frost. And in terms of Mageta, Whis tells Chi-Chi a way to win, because she's up next. And not only is she ready to win this, but she's mad at Mageta for hurting Goten. Whis doesn't even need to tell her his weakness, because she just starts insulting him, and he jumps out of the ring himself. Wow, the insults weren't even that bad. She didn't know he was that sensitive. And next up, she's facing Kaba. It's weird to see a Saiyan from Universe 6. He looks very different from the ones in her universe. Although, it's kind of a weird judgment to make considering Chi-Chi wasn't originally a Saiyan after all. So who is she to nitpick? He seems like a nice guy. Although, she finds out that he doesn't know what a Super Saiyan is. Besides the thing he saw Goten doing. This ends up being a pretty fun match, although Kaba doesn't learn how to do Super Saiyan. Chi-Chi ends up winning, and goes on to the next round against Hit. This will actually be a chance to test her true power. Instead of using just Super Saiyan or Super Saiyan 2, she can start using godly techniques. She does pace herself against Hit, but it becomes very clear that he's too strong for her. So she reveals something that really no one's seen yet besides Goku and Vegeta. In Super Saiyan, she's then surrounded by a blue glow, illuminating the entire arena. It's a relatively calm transformation too. She barely moves. And once it's complete, she's revealed there now with blue hair. This is Super Saiyan Blue. Goku claps. That was a great reveal from his wife, although he kinda wished he was the one to reveal it, but whatever, that was still cool nonetheless. Vegeta just scoffs. And for a brief while, she is actually able to keep up with Hit. But Hit then begins picking up the pace. Not only is pure progress helping him, but he begins using his time abilities more and more. Chi Chi begins getting overwhelmed. And even in this new form of hers, with this great new power, it might not be enough. And if anything, she only made Hit stronger. Hit knocks her out of the ring, and next up is Goku. And it's a similar story with him. He shows off Super Saiyan Blue as well. Although, he's pretty even with Chi Chi in terms of power, so nothing he does against Hit works. There's only two people left Vegeta and Piccolo. The one up next is Vegeta. Piccolo knows that Vegeta is likely stronger than him, so he's hoping that he can finish this. But Vegeta's got a trick up his sleeve. While those two have Super Saiyan Blue, he has been discussing an idea with Kakarot. One that Kakarot never actually went for, but something that Vegeta can do and decided to make his own. Although the chances of it working are slim, but Vegeta has the highest chance of making it work. He then powers up into Super Saiyan Blue, but continues powering up beyond that. A red glow illuminates the arena on top of his blue orb, as Vegeta shouts Kaioken. Just like he did in the Buu Saga with Super Kaioken, Vegeta has now combined the power with Super Saiyan Blue, creating Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken. Kind of a mouthful, but cool and powerful nonetheless. In Blue Kaioken times 10, he completely outpaces him. Even with time skip, Vegeta is just simply too fast for him to keep up. And it doesn't end like it did between Goku and him. Vegeta actually goes the distance, knocking Hit out of the ring, taking the win, and winning the tournament for Universe 7 in the process. All the spectators were amazed with his power, but there's another person that ended up watching these Saiyans fight, after the fact. Someone who is also pretty intrigued with the Saiyan's power. So let's start by setting the scene, traveling to the future timeline, going back a couple years. Goten, Trunks, Bulma, and everyone else are on Earth like normal. They enjoy the new peace time that they have after the androids are defeated, and luckily it seems like there's no threats right now, at least not any immediate threats. But knowing the future timeline, that's bound to change. Eventually, Shin and Kibito arrive to Earth, warning Goten and Trunks about what's about to happen. Apparently, a monster named Majin Buu is about to appear, or at least, someone's trying to revive him and he's about to arrive on Earth. They need to stop him before Majin Buu's revived, or else, the entire galaxy, maybe even the entire universe is at risk. 
Well, they knew a new threat would come around someday. I mean, that's pretty standard for Earth. So they have been training, but they take Shin's advice. They go with him to the Sacred World of Kai's and begin training there. Already, things seem to be going much better for them. In the main timeline, all they had was Trunks, but here, they have Goten as well, who's equally as strong as Trunks. He's clearly a pure Saiyan too, however the hell that happened, they could tell by his tail. But Shin and Kibito aren't gonna ask any questions, as long as they have two people helping, that's really all that matters. So the first order of business is trying to release the Z-Sword, and with their great power, it doesn't really take too long. Of course, there is some struggle, that's the whole point of it, but they eventually free it and begin training with it. Trunks is obviously better suited for it because he's more of a swordsman, although Goten does swing it around from time to time. They share the sword, and they're making some great progress. Shin and Kibito are amazed. They're growing really quickly. They know that's standard for Saiyans. But at this rate, they'll be more than enough to defend Earth, defeating Deborah and Babidi and defending Earth against Majin Buu. And that pretty much is the case here. They go to Earth, ready to fight, with the biggest threat being Deborah. And in the original story, it took Trunks going Super Saiyan 2 to actually defeat him, but here, they have two Super Saiyans. With Trunks being a little bit stronger than his mainline counterpart, pretty much because he has Goten there training with him. This doesn't mean the battle's gonna be easy, not by any means. Likely there wouldn't be some close calls at Shin and Kibito, although thanks to the perfect fighting synergy of Goten and Trunks, as well as their amazing power, they're able to pull through, eventually defeating Debora, defending Earth, and stopping Majin Buu's revival, with both of the Kai surviving through the experience. Eventually, they do return to the Sacred World of Kai's to train. They want to get even stronger than they were before, going beyond Super Saiyan in any way possible, and they improve pretty much every aspect of them. Even Fusion, whenever they fuse into Gotenks, they have a better hold of him, knowing to regulate their power to make the fusion last as long as possible. And to make things even more efficient, sometimes they fuse into Gotenks and use the Z-Sword. It trains both of them at once, while also making the fusion itself more efficient. They go on with this training for a few more months, and one day they're all resting on the planet. They feel a light tremor, as the hybrid Saiyan and the Saiyan are woken by an explosion. Kibito rushes over to them, unsure of what's happened, and they can't sense or find Shin anywhere. This definitely isn't good. They rush over to where they saw the explosion, and as the smoke clears from the area, they only see one thing nearby, Shin lying on the ground, dead. Trunks is then alerted by something above him. He saw something moving through the smoke, and he immediately goes into Super Saiyan, flying towards it to attack it. Goten tells him to wait, unsure of what's lying ahead. But Trunks doesn't care. He immediately begins fighting this unseen threat, and as the two of them keep clashing, the smoke eventually clears the area. And when Trunks sees who the villain actually is, he's left completely dumbfounded. Goten looks up and has an even more severe reaction. There's no way this is actually happening. The person that attacked them, it's... it looks like... Goku? No, that, that can't be true. Goku died in this timeline, and if this was the past Goku, how did he get here? And why is he evil? What's happening? So many thoughts are racing through Goten's head, he doesn't even know how to react to this. No matter who this guy is, Trunks is gonna fight him. He continues clashing with Black, realizing that his power is way higher than theirs. Crap, even fusion might not be enough. At least, not at the moment. It could barely help them, but they don't want to take the risk. But before Trunks can even continue fighting, he's then grabbed by Kibito, teleporting him to the surface, grabbing Goten, then teleporting everyone back to Earth. Goku Black watches on, smirking. He'll see them again pretty soon. So yeah, I am going with Goku Black in this scenario. Now, I could have done Vegeta Black, and funny enough, I actually have a reason to do Goten Black here, but I feel like Goku Black will work better. A lot of Zamasu's hatred was directed towards Goku himself. At least, that Goku in his timeline. So, when making this video, it was pretty much 50-50 with me. And it's not like Vegeta Black would be entirely original, I've done it in a lot of scenarios before, but especially with the dynamic of Goten existing in the future, I feel like Goku Black would be nice. Well, not for him, but for the story. Anyways, short tangent aside, everyone's back on Earth, and they're deciding what they should do. is really the only one leading them right now, since there's no Supreme Kai anymore. He did try to heal Shin, but nothing worked. He was dead, and it seemed like there was no way of saving him. Goten's pretty shaken up by all of this stuff. That guy couldn't have been Goku, right? There's no way that was actually his dad there. Trunks tries to support Goten, getting him to snap out of it. He knows it was something unexpected for him, but still, they need to figure out how to stop this. As well as figuring out who he actually is, there's no way it was Goku. So what's the best course of action now? Obviously they are preparing, trying to get stronger in any way possible, continuing their training except here on Earth. But Bulma does have a backup plan. She still has the time machine, and since Earth isn't under attack right now, this is her perfect opportunity to work on refueling it. Just as a failsafe, in case their training doesn't work, they could always go back in time. But of course, it's not hard for Goku Black to locate everyone, and this short opportunity is quickly washed away. He arrives on Earth and begins wreaking havoc, trying to find Goten and Trunks, the two sinners. Mortals messing with time. They think they're gods or something. It's despicable. 
Goten, Trunks, Kibito, and Bulma are all on the move constantly, trying to remain unseen while also trying to help Bulma work on the time machine. As much as Kibito hates the idea of them time traveling, he knows that the situation is pretty dire, so he does try to help out the best he can. But no matter how hard they try to avoid him, he eventually locates them. But this might have been a big mistake for him, and Kibito notices something interesting this time that he saw before. That earring that he's wearing, it looks oddly familiar, almost like the ones that he has on. Now, Kibito would probably be the least knowledgeable of the Kais, especially since Elder Kai's not there, but of course he would recognize this earring, and probably even the time ring. Not that he would have used it in the past, but he's probably heard a little bit about it or something. Is this person related to the Kais or something? He's not entirely sure what's happening. But what's important now is that they try to fight him. Although this time, Goten's reaction is much more severe. He doesn't know who this guy is, but he sure as hell knows that it's not Goku. This isn't something his dad would do. And hearing that someone's impersonating Goku, that doesn't sit right with Goten. Seeing someone who looks like his dad destroying Earth, destroying planets, killing the Supreme Kai, all while trying to go after them, Goten's not having it. Goku blacks his hand out, launching a blast right at Goten. But right before it makes contact, Goten shouts, powering up immensely. The blast completely dissipates, eradicated by Goten's aura. Trunks looks at his friend in amazement. He powered up into Super Saiyan, but something's different about it. There's electricity surrounding it. His power's higher. They don't know what it is, but Goten just powered up into Super Saiyan 2. His emotions completely overtook him, and now he's going to channel them into his power. He tells the three others to escape, get in the time machine, and leave as soon as possible. Trunks says he can't do that. They only have enough fuel for one trip right now. They can't even do a round trip. And what about Goten? They're not just going to leave him here. Goten tells him not to ask questions, just to leave right now. He's going to handle this. He just wants to make sure they're safe. Trunks feels that Goten's not thinking clearly right now. But after all the stuff that just happened, Goten tells Trunks this is the clearest that he's been thinking. He'll defeat this Goku lookalike. And if not, he at least wants to give the others a chance to escape. He launches up towards Goku Black, getting a direct hit, dealing some significant damage. As the clash begins, the three others escape. They hope Goten's going to be okay. They're hoping to get some help in the past, bringing it back here to solve the threat if Goten can't. As the time machine disappears, Trunks watches in anticipation, telling his friend to hang in there. On the lawn of Capsule Corp, a crowded time machine appears out of nowhere. Present Trunks looks inside, finding that there's three people in there, not sure what this vehicle is or who these people are. But then he gets a look at their faces, recognizing all of them. One looks like his mom. One looks like that weird god guy that he saw before, but he's not too sure who he is. And the other one, it looks like him. Present Bulma immediately comes out and sees, with other people like Vegeta, Goku, and Chi-Chi rushing over. Well, it's cool that they get to meet future Bulma and future Kibito for some reason, but why is Goten not here? Trunks begins explaining immediately, saying they need to return to the future as soon as possible. Once everyone's caught up to speed, they don't even know what to say. Goku and Chi-Chi are especially worried because of what they heard about Goten. They just hope he survives and they can make it back in time. Bulma immediately begins working on refueling the time machine, alongside her future self, quickly running into the Capsicorp building. As Goku tries getting more info out of Trunks, they eventually see something appear in the sky, a weird black portal of sorts. And sure enough, the person that comes through it is Goku Black. Now that's an interesting surprise. Trunks traveled back to this timeline just like he expected, but it seems everyone's already here, even Goku. Angrily, Goku and Chi-Chi look up towards him. Goku Black begins his monologue, but Goku cuts him short. What did he do with Goten? Goku Black begins laughing. He says that poor Saiyan couldn't hope to fight him. His power was simply too strong as expected of a god. As much as he hates to admit it though, he wasn't able to kill Goten, but he did get pretty close, injuring the Saiyan as he escaped. And that's all Goku and Chi-Chi needed to hear. They do feel a bit of relief knowing that he's okay, but more importantly, they feel anger at the fact that Goku Black tried to kill him. Not only that, but the fact that he's even impersonating Goku in the first place. This isn't just them fighting a threat, this is personal now. Instantly, the two of them power up into Super Saiyan Blue. Goku Black doesn't even register what's happening. The wind is knocked out of him as he's then kicked in the back, launched towards the ground below him, then being kicked once more and launched up into the air. He then receives another hit, and another. The two of them keep knocking Goku Black back and forth. Within the span of seconds, they deal a significant amount of damage to him. He tries to activate his time ring, but before he even can, he's met with two Kamehamehas, combining together, hitting him head on. Goku and Chi-Chi mean business, and Goku Black dies in the battle. They power down, not saying a word. They're gonna help Trunks and everyone else, and Trunks thanks them for doing that. That power they gave off, he couldn't even sense it, but it was insane, he could tell. He didn't expect that they'd solve it that quickly. The three of them remain in the past, with Kibito meeting his past self and Shin. As everyone gets more and more informed about the situation, that eventually turns everyone's attention to Zamasu, leading into an informal investigation by Beerus. But thankfully, with future Bulma's expertise, 
Not much time passes before the time machine is refueled. With the two Bulmas working together, they were able to get things back into working order pretty quickly, and they're just about ready to return to the future. Just to be safe, they also did get some extra fuel in case they do need to return. But with Goku Black dead, they're sure that everything's gonna be okay, although they'll all remain alert. Goten then flies over, giving a few Senzu beans to Trunks. He's kinda bummed because he wanted to see his future self, but this is fine. He tells Trunks to make sure that his future self is alright. And Trunks nods, he's sure that future Goten's more than okay. At least, he's remaining optimistic. The three of them board the time machine, waving goodbye and thanking everyone once more. And once they arrive in the future, they notice that everything's pretty quiet. With Goku Black now dead, the city is eerily quiet right now. But faintly, Trunks senses something, some energy nearby, recognizing it immediately as Goten. With the Senzu beans in hand, he flies over. And immediately he sees that Goten's in pretty bad shape. He's alive, but he is beaten up, and he's a little tired of it. But overall, he is okay. Although the concerning thing is, he asks Goten why he's powered up right now. Goku Black's gone. They killed him. Goten chuckles, glad to hear this. But he tells Trunks that Goku Black wasn't the only threat. Someone else just appeared, and he looked oddly like a Supreme Kai. He's been popping in and out. It seems like he's looking for Goku Black, and Goten doesn't know who he is or why he's here. But Goten's out to get him. He knows that this guy's probably responsible for whatever's been happening. Shin's death, the damage to Earth, and whoever that was that stole Goku's identity. Goten eats one of the Senzu beans, immediately getting healed, now feeling much better than before, as well as getting a bit stronger, which is nice. And it's good timing too, because as soon as he powers up, that Kai then returns. Oh great, Trunks is here too. It seems like this Kai already knows them. And he did have a brief encounter with Goten, but it went nowhere because he seems perfectly fine now. Goten wonders why he took no damage. He was sure that this guy wasn't that strong. But Zamasu introduces himself, then asking where Goku Black is. Trunks asks Zamasu for more info, then he'll tell him what happened to Goku Black. How annoying. But Zamasu obliges, explaining who he is, why he's here, what he's done, and who Goku Black is. Now angry, he shouts at the two of them, telling them to say where Goku Black went, fearing the worst, and his fears are confirmed. Goku Black has died in the past. And Trunks tells Zamasu that he's next. But there is one little issue. Apparently this guy's immortal, and they thought he might have been bluffing, but he explains, mentioning how he used the Super Dragon Balls to gain immortality. But they tell Zamasu that they don't care. Even if he's immortal, that's only gonna prolong his pain, and they'll find a way to stop him, whether it's killing him or something else. The two look at each other and nod, as they then perform the fusion dance, with Zamasu unsure of what's happening, as Gotenks then appears. He lunges at Zamasu with the Z-Sword, slicing the Kai in half. He then swings more and more, turning Zamasu into a bunch of little pieces, and finishing it off with a blast, seeing if that erases him for good. And sure enough, it doesn't. He regenerates back from it, although he definitely did feel that attack. He might be immortal, but he's not immune to pain. And before he can even recollect himself, his arms are then suddenly restrained. Rings of energy appear around him. Gotenks has used his galactic donut, holding the Kai in place. It's too strong for Zamasu to escape, and he wonders why Gotenks isn't attacking. And that's really because he's dumbfounded. The Fusion's not too sure of what he should do right now. I mean, they could hold him in place, but they can't accomplish this forever. Huh, this might actually be harder than Goku Black. Zamasu feels insulted. They don't even seem concerned. Zamasu keeps taunting the fusion. No matter what they try, they can't kill it. But Gotenks retorts saying that he will find a way. He just needs some time to think. For the next 10 minutes or so, Zamasu stands there restrained, trying to wiggle his way out of the galactic donut, but nothing works. If only they had some way to seal him or something. You know what? Maybe the immortality has some sort of limit. If they completely destroy him, every single little bit of him, and make sure it doesn't regenerate, that might work. They try to do it with Zamasu again, and he just regenerates, as they immediately restrain him once more. Zamasu is getting really annoyed by this point, but there's nothing he could do. And out of his sheer anger, he powers up, and this time he gets released from the Galactic Donut. He launches over towards the fusion, with a keyblade in his hand. Gotenks quickly draws his own sword, hitting Zamasu with it. But this time, something different happens. A bright flash of light appears, as Zamasu screams. Gotenks still holds the sword in his hand, and he can't see Zamasu anywhere. But then he hears a voice calling out to him. He looks down at the ground, shocked to see that there's someone else dressed like a Kai down there. They descend to go talk to this Kai, and he's really old for some reason. This Kai dusts himself off, introducing himself. He was looking for a way out of that sword, and with all the time in the world in there, he figured out that he could probably just seal someone else in there, swapping positions with them, and that's exactly what he did. Gotenks is completely confused, but Elder Kai explains further. Not only did he just seal Zamasu and help them, but he freed himself from the sword. It's a win-win. Obviously, they don't know who this guy is, but he seems like a good Kai at least, so maybe that's something. And he was a former Supreme Kai, so he would be a good replacement for Shin, probably. Elder Kai's caught up to speed as well, and he knew that the person he sealed was a bad guy, but he didn't realize he was that bad. Well, seems like he made a good choice. 
and Gotenks chuckles. Huh, that must have been what was so powerful about the Z-Sword. Although they wonder who sealed Elder Kai in the first place, but that doesn't really matter right now. All that matters is that they stop these two threats. Goku Black's gone, and Zamasu is sealed away. But they're gonna make sure to be very careful with the sword. It's probably a good idea to not train with it anymore. And with that, we'll end off here for now. So now we're heading to what's possibly the penultimate part of the series. A lot has changed already, and with Chi-Chi being part of the story now, all of those things snowball together, completely altering the landscape of the Tournament of Power. Immediately, we could see some changes within the team itself. Ever since the Universe 6 tournament, Zeno's been wanting to do this, and now, it's finally coming to fruition. Universe 7 now needs 10 members for the team. And the first three are pretty obvious, Goku, Vegeta, and Chi-Chi. Goku's not sure how to break it to everyone that the universe could be erased, but instead of bribing everyone with Zenny or whatever, Chi-Chi thinks it's best to tell them flat out. If anything, that would encourage people to join the tournament. Yeah, it's scary, they can keep it from the general public, but in terms of their group, it's better to not keep them in the dark. Even Goten and Trunks are told about this, because they will be joining the team. As we've seen in the scenario, Goten's pretty strong, as is Trunks too. They'll definitely be beneficial for the team, and of course, Gohan and Piccolo are there too. That makes seven. And the last three fighters are pretty easy to pick, Krillin, Tenshinhan, and Roshi. Without Frieza and the androids, we have Chi-Chi, Goten, and Trunks on the team replacing them. Goten and Trunks are pretty hyped up for this. Well, not for the fact that they could get erased, but for the fact that they could show off their true strength now, especially Goten. But they also have Fusion to rely on. It works so well for the other version of them that they've started relying on it more and more. Not too much because they do want to fight individually, but if they ever need it as a last resort, they have it. Piccolo even tells them this too. Don't use it unless they absolutely need to. It'll reduce the amount of fighters they have by one, even though it does make a stronger one. It's risky, but could help in the right scenario. As for Vegeta, he's continued his own path of training, alongside with Piccolo. The two have been trying out Kaioken more and more, and of course Piccolo has an advantage when it comes to this, but for Vegeta, he still wants to try and max it out as much as possible. Combining with Super Saiyan Blue was a really good idea. But besides just improving Kaioken, he wants to improve Blue as well. And he's found a new level of it, mastered Super Saiyan Blue. It's not too different from regular Blue, but it uses it at 100% efficiency. Although, it's pretty hard to maintain at first. But thankfully Piccolo has a good solution. The two of them think it might be a good idea to head into the Room of Spirit and Time together. Not only to train Super Saiyan Blue, but to train Kaioken. They go in for about a day, which is a year on the inside, and not only does Piccolo see some great gains, but Vegeta sees a considerable increase in strength as well. This is mainly seen in his Super Saiyan Blue form. He's got a better control on the perfected version of it, and has found out a way to actually use Kaioken on top of it. At first, this was really hard to maintain, but with that year of training, it actually really helped a lot. Not to mention, he's able to use Kaioken at even higher levels now. This actually makes him the strongest person on the team, far above anyone else, even Goku and Chi-Chi. Perfected Blue alone is one thing, but the fact that he has Kaioken on top of it, and Kaioken at higher levels, well, it's a deadly combination. And as for Piccolo, training alongside Vegeta so much is really helping, especially with the two of them using Kaioken. But besides that, I don't think I need to cover anything else before the tournament, and now we can head into the actual battle itself. The team heads to the World of Void as the tournament begins. Right away the Saiyans get to work. Surprisingly, the first thing Goten does is go after Frost. He knows that Frost could be a wild card, so he decides to surprise him. Not only showing off his increase in power, but showing that he's serious about this battle. Catching Frost off guard means that Universe 6 has already lost a person, and that's actually the first elimination of the tournament. And of course Frost is pretty angry and he tries to kill Goten, but he gets erased right away. Trunks watches on during the whole thing and thinks it's pretty cool. And he and Goten are going to use that same strategy. They want to try and catch people by surprise. Gohan, Piccolo, and Vegeta work together a lot, dismantling a lot of the other universes. With Goku and Chi-Chi sticking together doing the same, everyone is pacing themselves too, they're all in base, and as for Piccolo, he's not using Kaioken. Although there are rare instances where Chi-Chi or Goku go Super Saiyan. But besides that, everyone's trying to be as efficient as possible and conserve as much stamina as they can. Gohan and Piccolo then end up facing the Universe 6 Saiyan, with the three of them teaming up against them. Although, this isn't as hard as it seems. The Universe 6 Saiyan still don't have Super Saiyan. If you remember from before, Kaba never learned Super Saiyan, meaning Caulifla and Kale don't have it either. They are still pretty strong as is, but together, Gohan and Piccolo are showing even more power. And this causes something really surprising to happen really quick, as Kale and Caulifla fuse way earlier on. They didn't realize how outmatched they were, and fusing seems to be their only course of action right now, otherwise they're going to be eliminated. So they break up the Batara early on into the tournament. This creates Kefla, who is a pretty strong opponent, although she is only in a base, and this is her maximum power. Kaba ends up getting knocked out pretty early on, and that serves as kind of a catalyst for this. At first, Gohan and Piccolo are challenged when facing Kefla, but the two of them continue powering up, as Gohan goes into Super Saiyan 2, and Piccolo activates Kaioken for the first time. 
This actually concerns Kefla. She heard that Kaba mentioned that the other Saiyans from Universe 7 could transform or something. And now that the both of them are seeing it up close, it's more terrifying than they initially thought. But they're not gonna back down. Although, Gohan and Piccolo do want to make this quick, in order to conserve as much stamina as possible, they go to their maximum power early on, with Piccolo showing off ludicrous levels of Kaioken. He could use times 100 pretty flawlessly, and he even goes to times 200. And as you can imagine, with these two strong fighters together, as well as a much weaker Kefla, they're able to knock her out. Goten and Trunks actually get kind of a kick out of this. You see, those two fuse too early. Although that method that they use is pretty weird. Their fusion dance, that's superior, and they're gonna say that for later on. But more importantly, right now, Goku and Chichi are about to face Jiren. Yes, both of them together. What do you think about it? It's pretty obvious that the two of them are going to stick together during this fight. Besides their relation, it's also the fact that they're basically the same person in terms of fighting. They're always looking for a strong challenge. And the two approach Jiren. Then they turn to each other, and Jiren wonders what they're plotting. And then, they play a game of rock, paper, scissors. This just confuses him and kind of insults him in a way. Jiren tells them flat out, one of them isn't going to be enough. So... They decide not only would it be better to fight them together, but it might be more fun. The two power up and begin cycling through their forms, eventually reaching Super Saiyan Blue. And even with the two of them fighting together, it's still not enough. Alright, well they at least have one more form up their sleeves. They really hope they'll be able to obtain that thing that Whis was telling them about, but this should be enough for now. A really strong evolution of Super Saiyan Blue. Even Vegeta was aware of this, and he was wondering when they are going to break it out. He's more focused on Blue Kaioken, so it makes sense that they pursued their own evolution of Super Saiyan Blue. They begin powering up, surrounded by a dark bluish aura. Both of them are showing off Super Saiyan Blue Evolution, and they begin attacking Jiro. Individually, they wouldn't have been enough, but together, they're actually making some progress, although not a lot. They still need to gauge Jiren's power, and as far as they know, he's not even fully powered up yet, not even close. As that fight continues, the rest of Universe 7 faces their own opponents. Goten and Trunks end up facing Dispo, and together they're easily able to annoy him, which forces him to go into his light speed mode. And then the two of them realized why Kefla fused so early on. As a shame, Goten kind of wanted to eliminate more people himself, but at least he got Frost. He and Trunks agree to fuse, but they just need some help to hold off Dispo. Gohan then jumps in helping them once more, trying to buy some time as the two fuse together into Gotenks. Gohan uses Super Kaioken 2 to fend off Dispo, and as he's fighting the Pride Trooper, he suddenly sees a ring of energy fly overhead, descending down upon Dispo and then contracting. Gotenks was perfect for this, the Galactic Donut was just what they needed. Together, Gohan and Gotenks pick Dispo up as he struggles to try and escape the Galactic Donuts. And pretty casually, they just throw him off the stage. That was pretty fun. Gotenks wants to try and conserve as much energy as possible. They're almost halfway through the tournament at this point, and if Gotenks conserves his energy, he could try and make the fusion last the entire time. Or at least whatever time is remaining. Vegeta's focused on weakening the ranks of the other teams. Using Blue Cow Cannon Burst really helps him with this. Not only does it make for some great surprise attacks, but it gives him the power that he needs in a pinch. He and Piccolo take out basically the rest of the Pride Troopers besides Dispo. Although, Topo does seem to be an issue, but he doesn't transform into his God of Destruction mode. Without Frieza there to violently piss him off, he actually doesn't really have a reason to transform, or at least to abandon his morals. And because of that, Blue Kaioken Vegeta and Kaioken Piccolo are able to take him on, defeating him and throwing him out of the ring. All this time, Goku and Chi-Chi's fight with Jiren is still ongoing, and since the rest of the universes aren't that much of a threat anymore, others begin trying to pitch in and help. Surprisingly, even Hit jumps in the fight. He's the only one left for Universe 6 by this point, and he's accepted that they're probably going to lose. But instead of giving up, he'd rather team up with Universe 7 against Jiro. This guy's a loose cannon and they can't let him win. With Universe 7, at least one of them might wish people back. So really, this is his best chance at survival. Jiren gets trapped in a time cage, as Goku, Chi-Chi, and Vegeta attack together, with all three of them maxing out their powers. But even in the time cage, Jiren tries to power up more and more and eventually, he's able to break through, then going right for Hit and taking him out of the ring. Although, this actually did help Universe 7 a bit, and they thank Hit for his sacrifice. They're able to get a lot of good hits in, no pun intended, and they actually dealt some significant damage to Jiren, although he kinda does brush it off. But still, without Hit's help, Jiren wouldn't have been held in place, and this helped them actually make some progress. Gohan and Gotenks join in the fight too, as well as Piccolo. They ended up cleaning up the rest of the universes, and now Jiren really is the only main focus. The gods, at least all the remaining ones, watch on in amazement, not expecting Universe 7 to have been this powerful, but all the gods of Universe 11 laugh. Despite all their progress, Universe 7 is still not going to win. There's no way they could hope to defeat Jiren. Although a bit weakened, Goku and Chi-Chi are still ready to fight, and they power up once more. As for Gotenks, he has a trick up his sleeve too, 
showing off Super Saiyan 3, which surprises everyone. They don't know exactly what that is, but it seems strong. Although, he needs to make it quick because it will drain the fusion. And Jiren watches as the rest of the team powers up, at least the ones who can power up. Piccolo goes into Kaioken, Gohan goes into Super Kaioken too, with Vegeta using Blue Kaioken. So many different auras, he can't even keep track of what's going on. That's a lie, he can. All he needs to do is power up himself, which he does. They were able to do some good damage before thanks to Hit, with Hit also having dealt some damage as well. So the good thing is, Jiren's not at full health, nor is he at full stamina because he was fighting beforehand, although he still is in pretty good shape compared to the rest of them, mainly compared to Goku and Chi-Chi who didn't really stand a chance against him before. But now with everyone together, they're going to win. They're confident about it. Goku and Chi-Chi start off, attacking Jiren head-on to distract him. Together the two of them punch him, and he's thrown right into Vegeta, who then powers up Kaioken even higher. It's hurting him, but it's not that bad. He could push us beyond its limits, he knows it. Jiren throws a punch at Vegeta, but he's then grabbed by Piccolo who extended his arm in it. Jiren jerks his arm and that flings Piccolo over towards him, but Piccolo flips mid-air, throwing blast down at Jiren. This creates a smoke screen, and when it clears, Jiren is surrounded by a bunch of Gotenkses. The Super Ghost Kamikaze attack. All of the ghosts explode, which doesn't damage Jiren much, but destroys a lot of the ring around him. A couple discs carve into the ground as well, as Goku throws multiple Kienzons, with Chi-Chi helping too. The ring below Jiren gives out, and just in the nick of time, he jumps away. But when he lands, the other platform he lands on gives away as well. They were distracting Jiren from the fact that they were chopping up the ring, and he doesn't know which parts of the ring are safe and which aren't. He keeps trying to jump back in, but more of the ring keeps giving out below him, and if he uses too much of his strength, well then the rest of the ring will get destroyed as well and he won't have anywhere to jump into. They've already weakened the ring a lot, preventing Jiren from using most of his power, but he doesn't care. He keeps trying to attack, and the group continues destroying more and more of the ring together. They know they might not be Jiren by pure power alone, and this is their best bet. But they also do try and attack Jiren, and he's getting sloppy. He is facing a lot of people at once, and even though together they might not overpower him, they're able to annoy him. Plus, he's also focused on not falling out of the ring, and whenever he does land on a ground that's about to break, it trips him up. The group keeps pulling off all of these combo attacks, but also, they keep on destroying the ground below them. Jiren's unsure of why they're doing this. They're gonna lose as well if they knock themselves out of the ring, and they say they don't care. They'll find a way. The group completely shifts their focus. Jiren doesn't understand why, but for some reason, they're completely set on destroying the ring now. More and more of the ring gives up below them. Whenever Jiren tries to jump up, they even try and stop him. Combined Key Blast and Galactic Donuts try and do this, although they don't accomplish much. They do slow him down a bit though, but with so much of the ring broken, more people on Universe 7 even fall out. Piccolo is the first to go, then Gotenks, although each of them lend more energy to the other fighters that are still in the ring. Goku then falls through, and then Vegeta. It's just Chi-Chi and Jiren jumping on little chunks of the ring. The two clash mid-air, and then Chi-Chi is eliminated, but as Jiren lands back on the ground, he falls through, although he doesn't care, because he thinks that he's won. But when he's in the stands, he sees that Universe 7 is eliminated, and he only counts 9 fighters over there? Wait, where's the other one? Two of the humans did get knocked out of the ring before, Tenshinhan and Roshi, but Krillin? He never got knocked out. Yeah, he wasn't fighting this whole time, it's because he's been hiding. And then they see, on the broken pieces of the timer in the middle of the ring, there's a small chunk of rock that's about to fall apart. Krillin's holding on for dear life, and it seems he's the only one left in the ring. That was their strategy. They knew Krillin was there, and that's why they focus on breaking the ground. Jiren thinks it's foolish that he wasn't able to notice this. And because of that, Krillin's the MVP of the tournament because he's the only one left in the ring. He's glad everyone saw his plan, and that Goku and Chi-Chi made use of his Kienzons. Although, he has a big responsibility now. He needs to make a wish for Super Shenron. Now, Krillin's a pretty smart guy and a pretty good guy. First of all, he knows that Zen was watching, and second of all, he knows what the best wish would be. So instead of a selfish wish, he decides to wish for all the universes to come back. And the good thing is, just like he thought, this is what Zeno wanted. He breathes a sigh of relief, knowing that he didn't piss off Zeno. After the Tournament of Power, there's no real big changes yet. Everyone's training continues as normal, and life goes back to normal as well. Although there is one change that I want to talk about. Goku, Chi-Chi, and Vegeta have gotten together and made a play. So, Goku and Chi-Chi have a new evolution of Super Saiyan Blue, and Vegeta has Kaioken on top of it. Maybe they could try and help each other. If they're able to all learn each other's techniques, they can make something really powerful. Vegeta would prefer to keep his thing to himself, since it was kind of a thing that him and Piccolo worked on together. But hey, this might actually make him a bit stronger. If he's able to get their Super Saiyan Blue Evolution and combine it with his Kaioken, he could be unstoppable. And even if he does show them Kaioken, it's not like they're going to learn it as quickly as he did. This might be it. This will be Vegeta's chance to become the strongest fighter. One day they're all back on Earth, and a surprise visitor appears. Or I guess surprise visitors. The Galactic Patrol shows up, and they're trying to look for Majin Buu. 
And there is no Majin Buu. He was killed a while ago. But why are they looking for him of all people? Well, the Galactic Patrol isn't really too sure if this is going to help, but they explain to the Earthlings and the Saiyans. Maybe they can lend some sort of helping hand, although it is kind of a long shot. One of their deadliest prisoners has escaped, and they needed the Majin Buu's magical powers, or at least the powers of the person inside of him. That was the only way to stop Mora, this magician that escaped. Of course, this does pique the Saiyan's interest. Hmm, a strong new fighter, someone who's bad who needs to be stopped. This might be a good opportunity for them, not only for a good fight, but to test out their current strength. They've all refined their strength somewhat since the Tournament of Power, and this might actually be their calling, not just for Goku, Chi Chi, and Vegeta, but for Gohan, Goten, and even Trunks too. Although, those three are remaining on Earth. Only the three Saiyans are going to be going with the Galactic Patrol. They're not too sure if this is going to work, and this might actually make things worse, but it's at least worth a shot. They don't have anyone strong enough to face Moro, and even though these three can't counter his magic at all, maybe they could figure something out. As they head towards Namek, they learn more and more about this guy. Specifically, his ability to steal energy. Physically, at least right now, he's kind of weak, but if he gets enough energy built up, he'll be incredibly powerful. They need to figure out a way to avoid that somehow, which they're not sure they're going to be able to. Not to mention, there's a threat of his other magical powers, not just his ability to take energy. This will definitely be their toughest foe yet. With incredible technique like that, he might become strong enough to defeat them. But they're up for the challenge, and they'll figure out something that'll work. Eventually, they arrive on Namek and encounter the Magician. He looks much different than they expected. It's an old goat man. He actually looks pretty frail in comparison to them. Well, that's what happens when you're millions of years old. But maybe the looks are deceiving. Maybe he's way stronger than he appears, and that actually turns out to be the case. The first person to fight him is Vegeta. Now he knows this guy can steal energy, so he's going to be pacing himself here. He contains his aura as much as possible, first going into Super Saiyan which seems like it's not enough, then he goes into Super Saiyan God. And this is his opening, he can't let Moro get stronger than this. In Super Saiyan God he actually kind of overwhelms Moro, but more and more of his energy is getting drained. It's slow, but it's definitely happening and it's closing the gap between them. He powers up into blue and launches towards Moro. But now things are getting tougher, even Goku and Chi Chi end up joining in. This is kind of like Boo before. They have to somehow fight the threats in front of them without giving off too much energy. And, surprise surprise, Moro is able to steal more than enough to get stronger than them. No matter what they tried, it seems like it's unavoidable. And just like Mayrus feared, they only made things worse, although they were trying. And they did learn a bit about Moro, specifically how he fights, and possibly ways to try and outmaneuver him. But then they realize, why are they on this planet anyways? They never actually did go to Namek before. But isn't this the home to Piccolo's people? Wait a second. They actually never asked the Galactic Patrol, and it was kind of a big omission, but then they come to learn from Maris. Moro is here for the Dragon Balls. Wait, there's Dragon Balls on this planet? Well, they knew about the Super Dragon Ball, so it's not surprising that there's another set, but still. This could be really bad, especially if this dragon's more powerful than Shenron. The following is pretty much what happens with the regular story. Moro is able to defeat them, he then gets the Dragon Balls, and gets his three wishes. Even with Chi Chi here, and with everyone's different strengths, there's no way to stop him here. Goku, Vegeta, and Chi Chi can't even stay that long to try and fight him. Goku doesn't have instant transmission to rely on, so they all have to use regular ships to escape. And that's another thing. Goku never did go to Yardra in the story, so Vegeta's not going to be going there either. He'll actually have to stick around Goku and Chi Chi. As they try and figure out what to do next, but Maris has an idea. He'll train them. He actually does know something that might help them. Actually, his brother was the one to tell them, although they don't know he's Whis' brother yet. Whis was really hoping that one of these three could access Ultra Instinct somehow. Of course, that never happened so he is a bit disappointed, although it's kind of expected, not even the gods can obtain that, so maybe expecting a mortal to do so is kind of far-fetched. They might need some big catalyst or something, and they don't even know what Ultra Instinct is yet, so it might be a lost cause. But Mayrus wants to try and see, maybe he can just teach them the principles of it, even if they don't get the full power of it. Using the Galactic Patrol's Room of Spirit and Time, they begin training there. And meanwhile back on Earth, Moro's crew ends up attacking. Of course with how strong Piccolo is in this scenario, it's even easier to defeat everyone than it was before, except for one person, 7-3. 7-3 ends up stealing Piccolo's powers, and with Piccolo being much stronger here, that is a double-edged sword, especially because of one thing, he now has Kyle Ken. Those other prisoners weren't a threat at all, but now there's this guy who's able to steal powers. The worst part is he's an android, not like the ones from before, but a much more sophisticated one. Piccolo's powers are probably the worst kind he could have, as he now has Piccolo's regeneration and Kyle Ken combined with his infinite stamina, that's a deadly combo. Piccolo is quickly overwhelmed by him, angry to be losing to his own techniques, but thankfully help arrives in the form of a Gohan. The good thing is there's no other prisoners to worry about, just this guy. Together, they'll take him on. And surprisingly, even more help arrives. Goten and Trunks are able to sense all this, so they want to help too. Now 7-3 is up against four people. But he isn't worried. He powers up into Kaioken. 
going to levels even beyond where Piccolo was. Although there is one downside, despite him having infinite energy and regeneration, Kaioken still does tear apart his body, especially at such high levels. That does weaken his defenses a bit, and that'll help them out in the battle greatly. Goten and Trunks turn into Super Saiyan 2, with Gohan going into Super Kaioken 2. Piccolo tells them how 7-3 stole his powers too. As long as he doesn't touch their necks, they should be fine. He can't get any more powers beyond this. They really need to make sure of it. Goten and Trunks begin attacking together as 7 3 fends them off. Piccolo and Gohan take this opportunity to try and find an opening. They begin speeding up, creating a bunch of after images. Of course, at 7 3's intelligence, he's able to figure out which ones are real. And as he checks the after images, none of them are real. Gohan and Piccolo completely abandon the area already. And suddenly he's attacked from above, with a double Masenko from both of them. They're both powered up with Kaioken, and the entire area is illuminated red, not only from them, but 7 3 as well. 7 3 launches up in the air towards them. And once again, they fire another blast down at him. He dodges it, but is also hit from behind by an attack from Goten and Trunks, launching their own beams from the ground below. It doesn't do much damage, but they do hit him, and this leaves him open once again for Gohan and Piccolo. 7 3 tries to power up more and more, using more power with Kyle Ken, and then he reaches what quite literally is a breaking point for him. He's getting much stronger, but he doesn't have a control on Kyle Ken. Not to mention, the speed at which it destroys his body is faster than his regeneration. He launches a blast at them. And it's a really powerful blast, but as he launches it, his entire arm disintegrates from the power. He regenerates it and keeps trying to attack. And they see it now. That's their opening. The next time he attacks, they need to counter with something even more powerful. And the same exact thing happens once more. He launches a powerful beam, weakening his entire body as he does so. He becomes a glass can. Gohan and Piccolo jump up on top of the blast, using key in their hands to slack cross it. Goten and Trunks try to maneuver around it as well. And as 7-3 continues launching his beam maniacally, he suddenly sees four people around him, Gohan and Piccolo above him, with Goten and Trunks on either side of him. Four beams swirl into one, hitting him directly and point blank. Along with 7-3's own attack and Kyle Ken destroying him, these four beams finish the job, killing 7-3. And even with this victory, they know they need to fight more people later on. They're going to need to train more and more. And maybe Earth isn't the best spot for them, but they do have a great idea of where to go. Although they haven't been there in some time, they still have that moon base where they could train on. With sophisticated gravity training technology, it could really help them, especially Goten and Trunks, since they do want to get stronger and get involved in this fight. In case you couldn't tell already, Goten is much more confident in himself than he was before a few parts ago. Not only has he grown stronger, but he's learned to accept his strength. He isn't a weakling. He just helped defeat one of the biggest threats to Earth just now. He's more confident than ever. Gohan and Piccolo are going to help lead him down a great path, as well as Trunks being there alongside him. Thus begins the two months of training. As for Goku, Chi Chi, and Vegeta, they are beginning to obtain a new power. Just like I mentioned before, they're trying to combine all their strengths together. They want to create a deadly technique that's stronger than anything before. And it's probably the most powers they've had stacked together at once. They combine the powers of Evolution and Kaioken, creating what is simply known as Blue Evolution and Kaioken. Kind of a mouthful and a bunch of powers stacked together. But it's very useful for everyone. Specifically for Vegeta, it wasn't too hard for him to obtain Blue Evolution. For the other two, getting Kaioken was a bit tough, and they can still only use it at low levels, but it still does help them regardless, especially in a pinch if they need a lot of power. But as for Vegeta, he has a great control on Kaioken, and Blue Evolution wasn't hard for him to obtain. With this discovery, he shoots way past them in terms of power, although Maris can't help but feeling disappointed still. Not in them, but in himself. He wasn't able to teach them Ultra Instinct at all. They learned the principles, and they did learn about it, but they weren't able to obtain it. They still don't know how to move their body purely on instinct. And in terms of the transformation itself, they're definitely not close to that yet. But hey, this new power of theirs might be a good start. Not a good start in terms of obtaining Ultra Instinct, but a good start in terms of defeating Moro. If they get strong enough, even with Moro's great increase in strength and his energy absorption, they can overpower him before he gets too strong. And that's what they're aiming for. And in case their newfound power doesn't work, they do have one more trump card. But with the two months of training over, they all head to Earth once more. Moro's crew gets there first, and they're met by the defense forces on Earth. Although, it's not really a tough battle. Everyone on Earth is very strong, especially Gohan, Piccolo, Goten, and Trunks. Fighting alongside the Galactic Patrol and the Earthlings, they're able to defeat Moro's crew pretty easily. Not to mention, 7-3 is gone. They killed him a while ago, which Moro is kind of pissed about. He knew he might need his power eventually, but whatever. He'll make do without it. Watching all these people fight, they stand no chance against him. At least, not now. Eventually, his entire crew gets defeated. And just in time, the three Saiyans and Amiris show up. The good thing is with Vegeta not going to Yardrat, they don't get split up. All three of them together and they arrive on time. By now everyone on Earth knows Moro's powers. He can steal energy and he has other magical abilities. This might need to be a team effort. 
They need as much power as possible, while also not using key attacks. If they all attack him at once and don't give off too much energy for him, they might be able to overpower him. They outnumber him, and could probably outmaneuver him too. They just need to all overpower him at once, creating an opening for a key attack that can erase him for good, without him absorbing that attack. He's clearly much stronger now, they could tell by his physical appearance. Not only thanks to the wish on Namek, but also due to all the energy he's absorbed in the last two months. The all-out battle begins, with Goku, Chi-Chi, and Vegeta fighting in regular Super Saiyan. Moro thinks he's being mocked, they use much higher forms of four against him. But once again they're just pacing themselves, they want to see how strong Moro truly is right now. But as they power up more and more, it still seems like they can't defeat him, but they kind of expected this. They might actually need their trump card, just to make sure things go perfectly okay. This is their last chance, and they don't want to risk anything by fighting individually. They tell everyone about this, they just need some time. This trump card of theirs is fusion. After seeing it so many times, they've learned it on their own, specifically thanks to some help from Mayris. And during their training, they've been practicing it. They could pull it off perfectly, although they're not sure who needs to fuse. They've tried a few combos. Goku and Vegeta had fused, Vegeta and Chi-Chi had fused, Goku and Chi-Chi had fused. And all three of those fusions were strong, but of the three, one was more potent than any of the others. They asked the Earthlings to buy them some time, as the three of them retreat. They only need a couple of seconds. And quickly, right after they retreat, someone returns. Vegeta, launching out from behind the rocks. Although he's significantly weaker than he was before, and that gives away who fused. To make sure this works, Vegeta gave all its energy to Chi-Chi and Goku. And as he lands a punch square in Moro's face, Moro is then blinded by a giant flash of light behind Vegeta. And out jumps a brand new fusion. The fusion of Goku and Chi-Chi, which we will call Chiku. And I already know what everyone's biggest question is going to be. A male and female fusion. What does that create? Well, Dragon Ball Fusions actually had two of these, and both times they ended up being a male fusion. But since that was a different type of fusion, and just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say this fusion has no gender. Immediately, Chiku is already in Super Saiyan Blue. They're quite the powerful fusion, and Moro learns that right away. They need to be both efficient and focus on not getting their energy drained. That's why right now they're just in blue, but also focus on defense, trying to employ the tactics that Mayrus taught them, specifically with Ultra Instinct. Although they aren't actually using Ultra Instinct, they're trying to move their body instinctively. And it actually somewhat works, it also trips Moro up in a way. And even with Moro's great magical techniques, this fusion is just simply too fast for him. They're too powerful, they're too smart. It's the perfect kind of fusion. I mean, just look at the compatibility. It's a husband and wife fusing. They have the same exact training, the same type of techniques, and similar power. They're not just a couple, they're rivals, perfect rivals. It's possibly the best fusion they could have ever hoped for. A fusion of rivals, lovers, and friends. And they show off this extraordinary power to Moro. Quickly, the fusion powers up in the Super Saiyan Blue Evolution Kaioken. Wow, that is a mouthful. The area is illuminated by a purplish glow. The blue from the aura of evolution, and the red from the aura of Kaioken. As the others work to hold Moro back, it creates the perfect opening for Chiku. And what better way to finish this than a Kamehameha? They start off first by using one of Goku's attacks, a Meteor combo. They need to weaken him physically first, they need to make sure he doesn't absorb this Ki Blast. After a flurry of punches and kicks, Moro is launched far away. As he flies through the air, he tries to stop himself, but Chiku then rapidly flies behind him. And before Moro can even turn around and open his mouth, it's already too late. They launch the most powerful Kamehameha ever known to anyone hitting Moro directly without him being able to absorb it at all. The blast is massive, as it flies out into space it gets wider and wider, expanding out as it becomes hundreds of miles wide even. For a brief moment in time, the entire galaxy is illuminated, turning everything a bright bluish green. And just as quickly as it started, it ends. Moro is defeated. And with the huge amount of power they use, Goku and Chi-Chi defuse soon after, hugging each other in celebration, glad that they finally defeated the threat together. Mayrus breathes a sigh of relief, he is kind of bummed they didn't learn Ultra Instinct, but it seems they made things work their own way. And even though Whis wasn't there, he was watching on Beerus' plan. His brother did a great job, as well as his students. They were able to figure out something amazing, defeating their strongest foe yet. To think all of this started from an accident, a misinformed wish that turned Chi-Chi into a Saiyan. But it was a great accident, the results were tremendous. And now, or at least for the time being, everyone will get to enjoy peace time on Earth. And with that, we'll be concluding the series, at least for now. So. What did you guys think about this scenario? Do you think anything else would have gone different? Leave any thoughts in the comments below. I'd like to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. And let's try to hit that like goal from the beginning of the video. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting the bell icon so you're notified about any future uploads on this channel, including more videos like this one. Anyways, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in whatever video is next.